again. <laughs> oh, this is fascinating. I, I love the connections back to the Sargasso Sea and the um, collecting of DNA samples from multiple species because uh, all of that ties in to um, the new race of beings that you're talking about. And very quickly, the new race of beings, <clears throat> these are vessels, the DNA manipulation, the merging of natural and, and synthetic DNA is really for the purpose of creating vessels that can accept the demonic spirits, the fallen angels. They have to have a host body. So Craig Ventner is creating the host bodies, is the way I see it. Um, along with that, as we're getting into the neutrinos and antimatter, they need to create a new environment. And so with a new race of beings, you obviously have to have a new environment for them to occupy. And this all goes back to what they call the Golden Age. And that's what they're referring to <clears throat> in the Hindu practices that you illustrated there, is the creation of the new, the new race, which will be an immortal race because of the elixir that they are extracting from the, uh, from the snake, from the serpent. And we have to remember that all of these things are symbolic of actual physical processes. Um, human beings are trying to communicate to people into the future, which is our generation. We have ancient societies and civilizations that are trying to communicate to us through the ages using myths and, and symbols, symbology, to represent physical processes. So when you put up that uh, image, if you want to put it up again, Chris, of the serpent and the phallic symbol or the earth, the pillar, and the serpent um, being twisted about the earth, exactly that one there, that resonates real well with what is going on at CERN. Um, essentially what you have going on here is something that I haven't spoken much of, but we're moving into the field of pure physics and toroidal fields, magnetic fields, uh, magnetic lines of, of, uh, of magnetic energy, magnetic fields that surround the Earth, but all of the planets. But specifically to this one, what, you're, what is being represented here is a toroidal field. And a toroidal field will have a hole in the middle. It looks much like a, uh, or a torus, more specifically, looks like a donut. If you can represent or transfer the image of a donut onto this, you actually have the earth in the middle filling that hole of a donut, and then the <laughs> ring around it are the magnetic lines of force, which here are being represented by the serpent. And it's interesting that you have seven heads to the serpent because numer the, the numerology associated with seven that we see everywhere but also this gets into the, um, the elements that are involved as well as the magnetic lines of force. Seven plays into that. So my point here is that we are looking at humans trying to portray very complex physical or physics processes that exist that they can't really, pardon the pun, but wrap their head around it either in order to communicate it because as we know, complex mathematics and physics has not really existed in the public consciousness over the last 2,000 years. Uh, and so how do you carry that message forward through people that are not going to have the same mathematical knowledge as the ancients had? And I believe the ancients were way ahead of whatever we're doing today, even with CERN, so also our bodies. Fermi lab is, is strictly focused on neutrino um, experimentation, and the neutrinos are, they're like tracers. They're indicators. Um, they're like color coding particles so that you can determine the location, presence, and quantity of the antimatter. And if you will, look at antimatter again. It's a reflection of matter. It's the opposite. Antimatter is, if we have to put the, the label of, of um, good and evil to it. Antimatter is the evil and the matter is God's creation. Again, we go back to the black goo versus God's plasma. 
this is um, <laughs> let me tell you, this is leading edge kind of stuff that you guys have broken. Um, you are pulling together CERN artificial DNA. You're pulling together the, elect the electric universe model. As far as I know, nobody's doing the things that you have done here today. I commend you. Chris, you have done a fantastic job of pulling together all the nuts and bolts that I throw at you from the science end and merging it into the mythology and the ancient Hindu. And now, Heidi, you're bringing in the Sargasso Sea. I had no clue that Craig Ventner yeah. went there and had that. I've known about Craig Ventner since 2009, but I had no idea he was gathering samples from there. But it makes total sense in the recombination the combinatorial process of DNA and languages and sciences and math and myth, like Tesla and Buckminster Fuller, they all said you cannot separate all of the disciplines. You have to pull all the disciplines back together. Look at Einstein seeking the unified theory, the single model, the, the, the single equation that represents everything in the universe. Everything, everything, and every discipline points to finding that single point. Look at what scientists do with the gravitational model, the Big Bang. They're looking for the Higgs boson. They're looking for the start of the universe. It's all about a single focal point. Same thing in all the disciplines, whether it's religion, music, movies, pure science, mm. DNA. That's the point that we have to make here today, is everything is going back to the singularity. So you have to ask the question, why? Why do they want everything to be unified, man and woman becoming you know, a sexless being? Why do they want to go back to one? I think it's because that's what Satan believes is the ultimate model. His hubris, him, why did he go against God? Because he thought he was better than God. He thinks he is the focal point of everything, including the universe. He does not want God's creation of man and woman. The two, he wants the one. He represents the one. All of the disciplines go to the focal point of one. If you are so full of yourself, all you think about is yourself. That's what Satan does. He thinks of himself, the one, the singularity. Everything, every discipline points to the singularity. It's all ego. Wow. Yeah. Thought of it that moment with Soylent Green as well. Hey, I wanted to ask you, Heidi, and also Chris, you're talking about the moon. You're talking about Venus being, um, there you go, uh, Venus uh, being uh, phosphorescent, phos phosphorus, excuse me. Um, yeah. Back in the, their golden age, as they call it, when we had um, an alignment of Saturn, Venus, Mars in alignment with the Earth and in close proximity to the Earth, close enough that it actually blotted out the Sun and you could only see the corona of the Sun around the edges of Saturn. So if you picture that, that's what they're trying to accomplish with CERN. That's what they're trying to get back to. They're trying to get back to without actually realigning the planets because they don't have the ability to do that, but they're trying to electrically through this Birkeland Currents electric plasma, they are trying to reconnect those planets, again, Saturn, Venus, Mars, to Earth, and recreate when they terraform the planet back to the way it used to be in their time, to an electrically charged environment, atmosphere, much denser atmosphere, um, for this new, new race of beings. That's what they're trying to create here. They are using CERN to do this. This is where I'm going. I won't dominate it, but we're going to the electric processes that are actually going on at CERN, and I'm going to have you write down the name of an experiment at CERN for you guys to do some homework on. It's called AWAKE. A-W-A-K-E. That's the name of the experiment at CERN. And it has to do with plasma and particle acceleration of of uh, uh, those acceleration of particles using plasma. I won't go into that because it's a whole other discussion, but that's where I'm going with, with my research. The point here is that 
they want to electrically reconnect the planets, but in my alignment of planets I just described, Saturn, Venus, and Mars to Earth, and we look at the tree of life, the planets that are represented there, I don't see the moon. I don't see the moon represented in their ancient alignments of Saturn, Venus, Mars. So that draws me to the theory, to the conclusion perhaps, that the moon is artificial and that the moon so was not it. here in the Golden Age. Okay. All right, you're talking about green. Think about Aurora Borealis. What color predominantly it is? It's green. That's magnetic plasma. Now, in this graphic, you have the green at the top and bottom. But look in the middle. That is the donut. That is the electrical magnetic field called the torus. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, let's start here. Yeah. yeah. Now, think of what you were saying earlier, Chris. You had the, the ancient drawing up there that I had never seen before and that you put up that showed them the... the um, let me describe it. You had CERN down below, you had the mirrors down below, you had the people working down below, and then you had the cross in between. Oh, yeah. That's a good picture. Okay. Put that, uh, yeah, put that up, because that is completely, yeah, perfect. All right. So tell me, at the top of the cross, the half dome, is that the moon with the pyramid or cone on top of it? Mm -hmm. That's the moon. Does that cross in this image, okay, take that and then go back to the plasma graphic that you had it just before this one with the tor torus. Uh-oh. Uh you mean the, this one here? We just had it. Yep. Do those not look the same? Do you see the cross? Yeah. Okay. So go back to the previous one. This one? Yeah. Okay. If we accept that this down below is the CERN Collider being represented as best they can to communicate forward into our time frame, and that the moon is represented above that cross, and the cross is the torus, that is an electrical field comprised of magnetic energy in the shape of a donut. We're looking at the cross section of the donut in the form of this cross. Hmm, going yes. up through, uh, going vertically in the cross is the plasma connection between the moon and the earth. In this case, the plasma connection that will be generated from below by CERN in the construct of Birkeland currents into a tightly formed Z-pinch or one single stream Z-pinch connecting to the moon. The donut is the key to the portal. If anybody wants to know what the portal looks like, if anybody wants to know where the portal is going to be located, that illustration just showed it. Chris? That's great. Again, you do this all the time to us, Chris. You are <laughs> always the one that knocks the ball out of the ballpark. Mm-hmm. That is well, it. it's Hottie's fault, you know, because she's, <laughs> <not doing it. laughs> I just, she's the I'm... one who got, she's the one, you know, when I figured this out, like, not just what you just showed, but I, I that's not what I figured out. I figured out the uh, holes in the pyramid and the, yeah. and the symbolism with this uh, double helix here. Yeah. I, I, I thought my heart was going to jump out of my chest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, I, the whole particles, you have to find them. Um, in a spatial reference, a, a three-dimensional reference, you have to find them um, in a Euclidean space, X, Y, and Z. And you have to be able to measure their mass and their energy, and you do that through spin. The spin of those particles generates energy, which they assign a color to. It isn't necessarily that they look like they're green, red or blue or purple, but they assign a color of the visible spectrum to the spin, the rate of spin of particles and the energy that is created by that spin. The momentum generates spin. So when you're talking about phosphorus, 
you are talking about quantum particles that have a color to them due to their spin, due to their rate of spin and momentum. So you are, in talking about phosphorus, you're also talking about quantum particles is my point. So you're right on track with that and I hope that clarifies your question, but you really are talking about the quantum world and DNA is a, our human DNA absorbs light. It is a receiver and a transmitter of light. The light being electrical energy from the universe. But Satan has his version of that, and that is the false light, the phosphorus, and that is the false light generated in the quantum model. The quantum model that I just described to you is all false. The quantum model that I just described that scientists talk about all the time is false. It is not real. Those are theories. Those are make-believe descriptions of what is really going on in the universe, which is electrical and electrical plasma and the movement of electrons and magnetism. So it doesn't surprise me that they, call, they color their false particles, their false theories, with false colors, and that phosphorus is also false and a false co color that absorbs rather than emitting. In other words, it has to take in the real energy in order to radi radiate its green color, a false color. Hmm. So that's a big mix up there, but the point is the real energy comes from God in the form of plasma. The false energy that is a false green emission that is generated by what I think you're on track with is the false DNA. It is the fallen angel DNA represented as the green phosphorus and therefore they are recombining all of those to create the synthetic vessels, the synthetic bodies. So it doesn't surprise me and then we see green in all of the associations with that. So it all fits is my point. No, the small cube down there is the adiabatic quantum computer. Oh, yeah. The reason that I say that is not only because it's, it's cubed, as you guys know, the computer is housed in a black cube, but there we talked about singularity. We talked about combining. The programming that is used in that computer, you've heard this before, but it's called combinatorial, combinatorial programming and that is comprised of taking all possible solutions at one time combining all, all of those probable solutions simultaneously I won't go into the, all of the stuff but in a, in a superposition supersymmetry super state process they are able to process simultaneously all possible solutions and derive a single answer so the programming process is exactly the same in the computer, as you see with DNA, with physics, with particle accelerators, everything that we just talked about. So what he is sitting on is a representation. Again, this is not actual. This is representative of what we see in our technology today. They're communicating to us from the past what we need to put together physically here in this time frame in order to achieve the same goals today that they were seeking to accomplish through spiritual technology in the past. Spiritual technology, technology versus hard science, quantum physics, if you will, today. Because they need the technology today, the machinery, because they don't have the same spiritual capabilities that they had in the past and I'm speaking of humans and humanoids that had spiritual capabilities that today we do not have so the yeah. machinery replaces that and that's the quantum computer that he's sitting on and he is artificially he is a transhumanist if you will that person sitting there hmm. is a transhuman that is connected and controlled by the quantum computer housed in that cube that you see him sitting on that's why they have the rod coming up the back. 
Yeah, I've seen this uh, in a lot of sci-fi where the person is plugged into the machine and is processing uh, and following and tracking and processing all everything. And so that that's a trip. That's yeah, he has his tuning fork there. But the, the two men that are, you, they have it faded out there, but I've seen it. You know, you, it's hard to find, but you can find, I got pictures of, where you can see the two in there, and they're on the little pole uh, doing some tillering, and they call the uh, vines. They're connected to like anti gravity, and they're called the. Uh, I guess it, it represents DNA, and um, they call it uh, the vines of a million years, and of the he the god head from the boat, and he has like some frogs and some rings connected to it, but. Um, there are always animals connected to what mm -hmm. they're doing with some kind of electric uh, magnetic forces and just like the bull in the in the heavens mm -hmm. they they have him connected to something and then we have the um, in the occult side they the a which is the a leaf it's also uh, different letters throughout time but the, it represents the ox head the bull and, well, that's, um, that's the chimera. That's the chimera of DNA, recombinant DNA, and the manipulation of DNA. The chimera, the mixing of animal and human DNA. And we go back to Craig Bettner. We go back to the Sargasso Sea, the electric eels. All of that plays into creating chimera. Um, can I can I just ask Anthony a quick question about Absolutely the plasma? Not. Absolutely no. <laughs> not. Um, you know, you said plasma is from God, right? Mm -hmm. Well, wouldn't Satan's version then be plasma that got burned with his electricity? Because Satan fell like lightning. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a burned version. I mean, I keep saying that, you know, all that black. Would that be mm -hmm. a good... Um, Comparison, I you suppose know? you could say that, but it is also, I think, representative of the fact that um, we are a carbon-based carbon -based species. Carbon is black. C60 carbon is what makes diamonds. Oh. Diamonds comprise, as I said earlier, the capstone to the pyramids for the transmission of energy. C60 carbon plays into this, and so what you're actually seeing, I, I think, in the black goo is a carbon-based plasma rather than an electric-based plasma. Now, they can make artificial diamonds, right, Anthony? Yeah, nano diamonds in my book, my second yeah. book, nano right. diamonds, you can make them through compression, um, vast pressure onto carbon. Um, but the actual, the more leading edge process is actually starting at the quantum level with um, the building blocks of, of, uh, of diamonds, which is a nano diamond taking self-replicating C60 carbon and allowing it to reproduce on its own. So the black goo is really black carbon. It is a nano black carbon, a nano diamond. It is wow. self-replicating and growing, and this is hard science. I'm not making this up. I take this all of my stuff right out of the science journals, and so that's why it's in my book, 2048 Diamonds in the Rough, mm -hmm. that we have multiple applications of nano diamonds mm -hmm. that are self-replicating, and that is what is represented in the black goo is rep self-replicating nano diamond C60 carbon. Wow. C6. What about the Saturn rings? Do you know what they're made out of? Yeah, that is a torus field. That's the donut. That is an electrical. Oh. Um, those are magnetic bands. That's the torus field, just like in the diagrams we're looking at. Uh -huh. Saturn, Saturn rings are a torus field. And so they're generated due to magnetic fields, magnetic lines that have gathered and attracted particles that we now visibly see as the rings, but it's like dust that is contaminated. The torus field is a great way to, you know, draw that analogy. Right. So right in the middle on your graphic you have posted, that's the rings of Saturn right in the middle. Mm -hmm. And you have 
the Birkeland currents going through the center of Saturn, as I said, the northern pole and the southern pole of Saturn are connected by Birkeland currents, plasma fields between going through the core of the planet. And the rings are exactly what you see right there, the donut. So that's what Saturn is made of. Yeah, it does have an, I know Saturn has rings, like seven rings, but it also has like a, an invisible gigantic ring that goes around it that we can't see. Yeah, that is that is the uh, magnetosphere of Saturn, just like we have in a magnetosphere around the Earth. Uh, right, that's the North Pole of Saturn. I've described that in the, in the electric model of the universe, or in the gravitational model of the universe, I have described that as the same as a synchrotron particle accelerator. Mm. The, north, the northern pole of Saturn is essentially the Large Hadron Collider on steroids. But that's in the gravitational model. The real description or definition, if you will, of the northern pole and those contra-rotating clouds, that's mm -hmm. plasma. Wow. You are seeing yeah. plasma moving in opposite directions due to the Z-pinch effect of the combining, the pulling together of the Birkeland currents, the two oppositely charged strands or ropes of current that are drawn together causes a Z-pinch, which then causes the acceleration of particles, and that causes the rotation of the plasma at the northern pole of Saturn manifested as contra-rotating um, clouds, if you will, as we see them visually, that generate synchrotron energies just like the Large Hadron Collider. Let me give you a hint of where I'm going in a whole nother program that we'll do. Okay. That's the, that's the awake, AWAKE program that I talked about will explain what I just said to you. The AWAKE okay. program at CERN is going to recreate in 2016, they're going to they're gonna finish construction. 2016, it will be representing the plasma acceleration of particles rather than the acceleration of particles that is being done presently within the Large Hadron Collider using radio frequency and microwave propulsion. To accelerate particles right now, like protons, they're using radio frequency energy and microwave energy as a force to accelerate particles. They're going to shift completely away from that. I shouldn't say completely, but predominantly away from using microwaves and radio frequency to accelerate particles, and they're going to use electric energy, electrons in motion, cathodes, projecting through a plasma cell. Right now it's going to be, a, I believe, a 10-meter in size cell of plasma that they will be sending particles through and causing the acceleration to four times the speed that they're able to achieve presently with the Large Hadron Collider. So we are looking at not 14 tera electron volts, but a quantum leap out beyond 30, 40, 50, maybe out to 100 tera electron volts using plasma to accelerate particles. A complete shift away from the gravitational model that at CERN and complete adoption of the electric universe model. It goes back to the graphic that you presently have up. It's that torus, that donut. That's the portal. That's the creation of the portal. They've got to have the power. I don't believe that they need to go to 100 tera electron volts. Everything that we see coalescing, my new book, everything yeah. we see coalescing in September tells me they've got enough power, 14 tera electron volts, to open this portal. So I don't think they need to go to 2016 and, and put together the AWAKE project and, and use the plasma to do it. They're going to, as I've said, they're going to use the present technology to achieve what they need to achieve. I could be wrong. I'm not dogmatic about it. Yeah. I just think September has got to be the big key to this. Well, let's get Heidi back for part two.
Um, okay. and, uh, I got to come up with some research. <laughs> hey, well, you know, Anthony no, brought I up the other. Anthony brought up the uh, the moon false satellite theory also. <laughs> so it's <Yeah>. like, <laughs> what's that moon doing there? Kind of a thing. Uh, one of those interesting things uh, I was picking up on, but well, I think the moon is there because they need it to be able to create this porous field. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it acts as a cathode, mm -hmm. and they need it there for electrical connection purposes. That's why it's artificial. They're bringing it in, and I'm I'm not going to tell you the project that I just was connected with yesterday privately. I shared it with you guys already, but think about what I shared with you yesterday, and think about the moon. And when I'm able to, when we get off the air here, I will send you an email and I will explain to you why the moon is artificial as it relates to the project that I was just invited into yesterday in high-level physics. Oh. That is going to answer why the moon's artificial, why it's in the position it's in right now, and why your graphic right there shows the moon shows the portal, shows the connection to the earth, and why everything's going to happen. And so leave that by email, a picture of that. The reason okay. that, that that piques my interest is, I'll just quickly go through this. The adiabatic quantum computer is housed in a cube. It's a, it's a shielded cube that shields it from all electromagnetic interference from the outside. Number two, do you guys recall that um, there's a monolithic piece of um, magnetic material, it's not a cube, but it's a rectangle that is in the UN, and they actually have it set up in a ceremonial room, much like yeah. a chapel, okay? So we have that. The other issue is, I don't know if you recall, but um, going back just a couple of years, in San Francisco and in the Bay, and also on the East Coast, I think it was Connecticut, they had two what were called Google barges. Yep. Okay, and these had shipping containers on them that were all welded together. This is in my in my book, um, 2048 Diamonds in the Rough. I used the Google barges in that. But the point is, if you've got a barge, you've got a cube, you've got the Google barges, there's maybe some crossover there. But the issue that I'm driving at here is that that probably in my estimation from a physics standpoint that cube offshore and I don't know anything about it I'm making conjecture here that was magnetic that it was a monolithic piece of magnetic material that would connect physically with the Brookhaven lab in New York the relativistic heavy ion collider that is rumored conjecture speculation at this point that it may have produced a directed energy beam at the base of the Twin Towers causing the explosions to take place and you mentioned the warping of the vehicles that's a directed energy weapon effect mm -hmm. so I really want to go down the rabbit hole here on this cube offshore because it sounds to me like it's tied to the collider at Brookhaven yeah and just to go over that what really keys in on me is this is the grand deception again what is the motivating factor what is driving 10,000 scientists at CERN to all be doing the same thing the agreed upon agenda and what what has brought all of these people to say yeah let's do this you're looking at the grand deception of immortality the original lie from Satan in the Garden of Eden was you will become gods. We've talked about that before. But I'm reiterating that because that's the core, pardon the pun with the apple, but that's the core of what is motivating and spurring these people to move forward with such dangerous technology is they truly believe in the golden age. They believe that when they open the portal they will be able to create a new plane of existence or enter a new plane of existence or bring in to our plane of existence a new dimension, a new plane of existence here, or the other way around, they may view the fact that opening the portal allows them to be transported into a new plane of existence, into a new realm 
of the Golden Age to remove themselves from this planet and go to maybe another Earth in another dimension, a parallel world that may in fact be what you would consider to be Earth, but exists in another plane of existence, another dimension. They, I'm beginning to suspect, believe that they are going to be removed from this dimension and moved through the portal into another. I have been under the perhaps misunderstanding or misconception that they were trying to bring entities into this world. Now that may be true. It may be a two-step process. They may be bringing entities into this world as step one through the portal. Step two is then they move with these entities back through the portal to this other dimension where it is the golden age and they ascend into this other golden age through the portal. I've maintained that at 14 TeV, Terra Electron Volts, that will establish a fixed portal. If you have a fixed portal in, say, September, then you have the ability to move through it in both directions. The Carbon 7 information you sent to me today, I think, demonstrates that they believe they're going to escape the problems of the Earth that they're helping to create with strange lits, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, Fukushima, whatever, they're going to leave this polluted and damaged world and go into another world that is their golden age world. And I'll stop there because that's a lot to digest. So mm-hmm. hold, that, hold that thought right there in that image. A couple of days ago I ran across the sonification of data from CERN. They've taken some of the data, the raw digital numbers, that come from the particles that collide in the detectors. And the detectors generate data from those collisions. They're analyzing the energy. They're analyzing the trajectory of the particles as they spin off from the collisions. This is the data that is in the computer. And they've taken the raw data and morphed it, if you will, or translated it into musical notes, much like the notes on a sheet of paper. And then they've actually played those notes. And you can go online and you can listen to this, but it is called the sonification of CERN. It's the music. It's the frequencies. Now, a couple of conversations ago, we all touched briefly on the fact that we believe that CERN has something to do with frequencies, generating frequencies, the use of sound by the ancients and today. Here you've got a representation of that sound within the pyramids. There's been a lot of speculation that frequencies are generated within the inner chambers and by the granite structure itself of the pyramids. Frequencies are a big deal. And so when you're talking about chanting and ohms, you're talking about digital representations of frequencies that are generated by the collisions at CERN. Um, We talk about the Hebrew and Sanskrit glass plates of ancient writings um, that are at CERN that are receiving energy in the form of frequencies from these collisions and that they have some occultic ritualistic process that's involved with having those um, those writings, those Sanskrit and Hebrew writings being subject to the frequencies that come from the machine. I mean, this all gets wrapped in together. But the fact that they actually came out and said, hey, here's the music of CERN. Here's the sonification of the data. I found amusing but also very enlightening. Maybe that perhaps the ancients, be it Romans, Sumerians, what can we say about September that we can pin on what they believe are their occultic dates that would also, we're looking at CERN, of course, doing their activities on significant dates. I'm looking at it from the timetable of experiments at CERN, their own published calendar, which is on my website, Um, and I like to overlay that with what you see 
as significant in the zodiac and in their practices and in their, you know, such as the boat of rock. Um, because again, we have to we have to look at both of those, the physics and the spiritual, to try to discern if we can what's going to happen later on. This the one that's kind of focused more on the pop culture, and I thank you for that. And and the reason that I I bring it up is that we know that they for whatever reason they have to announce what their plans are and we see that through pop culture and so I ask you the question and I know you're not prepared for this but do you see any movie releases that are coming up this year in particular in September that might be indicative of um, gravimetric distortions this is what um, Clyde Lewis and I spent many hours talking about last night on the radio and I, I hadn't heard of this and that's why it was fascinating to me but his conjecture is that possibly possibly the connection between CERN and this aircraft going down was due to the magnets at CERN causing a gravi gravimetric distortion of the Alps themselves and he cited Marcus Gurk in 1995, a geophysicist, Marcus Gert, published a, a speculative scenario paper in which he said that there are um, gravimetric distortions or anomalies, gra gravity waves that pass through mountain ranges, in particular the Alps, right where this plane went down. Um, also the Himalayas, the Southeast Asia, and Andes, and, and, and Arctica. In other words, what he's saying is there are these hairline thin waves of gravimetric energy that pass through and distort the mountains and also distort the areas above the mountains. And perhaps this plane would, uh, encountered a gravimetric wave and that's what affected its avionics and brought it down. It, it's probable. Um, he also cited Brookhaven Laboratory in New York the uh, RHIC, the particle accelerator, saying that there were at least three instances of aircraft, including possibly JFK's light aircraft, going down, JFK's son, um, aircraft going down that were attributed to by physicists and by the media at the time to the activities with the large magnets in the particle accelerator at Brookhaven. Now, again, it's all speculation. We're not accusing anyone of anything that's nefarious or illegal. But you look at the, the, the timing of events that are going on related to the timing of activities with these particle colliders and these massive magnets, and you have to say that there, there has to be some type of connection going on, whether it's deliberate or accidental, who knows. Um, going back to the 300 foot depth of CERN under the earth and gravimetric waves certainly if you're down in the earth that deep and you're producing waves of magnetic energy and you're distorting the gravity of the planet itself by doing that and causing earthquakes around the planet that has been shown to be happening with the activities at CERN it's not beyond the realm of possibility that their depth is for the purpose of affecting the earth and specifically its gravity, it, the gravity waves that already exist within the earth. And that may tie into using gravity as a way to help in the opening of the portal. So we're seeing spin-off effects in the, in the in the environment, whether it's aircraft or it's the movement of a Hurricane Aaron on the day of 9-11, moving from offshore to inshore towards New York at the time of 9-11, and the activities with the Brookhaven Laboratory and its magnets possibly affecting the course and the path of a hurricane. So anyway, that's a lot. My final conclusion on this plane crash is that, as I said before, I, I do think if we're going to make a correlation between CERN's activities and this plane crash, the fact that it was a single aircraft and not the multiples of other Airbus 
type aircraft, Airbus manufactured aircraft that were in the air at the same time, not necessarily in the same location, but why is it that only one aircraft was affected if it was affected by the magnetic activities with CERN and causing a gravimetric wave? I kind of differ a little bit away from Clyde. I mean, that's, that's an interesting theory and it, it may hold water. But because we're dealing with a single aircraft, a, a, a smooth glide path, consistent airspeed, and no deviation from course left or right, it's obviously under control, whether it's the pilot who was uh, allegedly left alone and locked in, locked himself in the cockpit. I don't believe that for a second. Or it was the autopilot. Or, and this is where my speculation comes in, a directed energy weapon, much like a tractor beam, utilized to overpower the aircraft and bring it down as a demonstration. Possibly a blood sacrifice, possibly a ritual, but to me it looks like that aircraft was under control by external forces and brought down. And no way to prove it, no way to put the label on someone and say they're guilty of a crime. I'm not doing that, I'm just looking at the physics and saying, yeah, th this is how it could be done. Yeah, the yeah, it's pure speculation. But you know, I'll throw the question I threw out on the radio and was hoping that we'd get a pilot that would or someone knowledgeable on that that could answer it. But why, in a two-hour flight, a short-duration puddle jump, you know, uh, shuttle aircraft, why would a pilot leave the air, the cockpit? shortly after reaching cruising altitude and cruising speed and essentially the autopilot being engaged at that point. Why would he leave the cockpit? Why was he unable to get through the door using the emergency passcode that he had? Was it suicidal? Was it a jihadist, you know, undercover? Who knows, whatever. But why would a pilot leave the aircraft I or the cockpit? I don't believe the cover story for a minute and when it's put out in the mainstream media as you know, the end-all uh, reason or, or conjecture on their part so soon after the black box being recovered when their own experts said it would take them days to decipher the, vo the voice recordings and, this, and the audible tones from the alarms. I don't buy it for a second and so that leads me to an external causa causation for the crash. I'm zero dot com. Um, you'll be able to find a link to that also on my website, anthonypatch.com. On the homepage, there's a link to the event. And it's Saturday, the 28th, at the Hilton Hotel in Portland, Oregon. It'll be from 6 until 9. Uh, we will do a sound and video recording, but probably only the audio will be available. Uh, tickets are $15 at, uh, ahead of time, $20 at the door. That covers our cost for the room. This is a very expensive room. It's at the top of the Hilton, the Skyline Room. We are not making a dime off that, off this event. That is not the point. It's simply to get the information out to everyone that we can. So I encourage you to attend if you're able to. And uh, I, I thank you, my brother and my sister in Christ. I love our conversations together. And we're going to do a lot more of these. Where there's a lot more that we need to explore and help get the message out to people to come to Christ. That's the bottom line. Who cares about the physics? Let's right. just move on with him. Amen. Amen. Do the dates and startups and things like that. But as uh, Chris posted there, um, one of the things that uh, or applications of CERN, the technology there, is as a directed energy weapon. And to define that, you're taking particles, subatomic particles, um, that are accelerated to 99.9% .9 of the speed of light, and I should correct myself, they're not subatomic. We're talking about um, particles that are the size of a ion, which is an, an atom that has been stripped of its electrons. So you picture it in its simplest form, taking atoms and smashing them together at the speed of light and creating massive amounts of energy. CERN is a large synchrotron. When we speak of the main ring, that is a synchrotron device, meaning that it generates synchrotron energies. These 
synchrotron machines, CERN being the largest, um, is replicated in smaller forms at smaller labs such as Brookhaven in New York. Um, I've cited the one at Berkeley several times, what they call their advanced light source synchrotron device. These all have arms that radiate out from the main ring, including the Large Hadron Collider. These are called beam lines. The purpose of the beam line is to take this energy and direct it towards an end point. At that end point are collectors to perform specific experiments, depending on the type of particles that have been um, collided and therefore the types of energies. For example, at Berkeley, they're generating what they call um, the brightest light ever generated by man, a hundred thousand times brighter than the sun itself. Now light is kind of a misnomer in the sense that you cannot see the light that is being generated at Berkeley with their synchrotron. They're generating x-rays, the highest powered x-rays that have ever been created. The purpose of those x-rays in one application is to look at DNA, the proteins of our DNA that I've mentioned before. And I will come back to DNA later on today in our discussion. But getting back to the beam lines, directed energy weapon, there are beam lines that come off of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN that terminate in certain experiments that they're performing on a larger scale with higher energies. These beam lines to make my point, can be utilized as the barrel of a gun, terminating or opening and allowing particles and energy to escape from the Large Hadron Collider, much as a bullet would escape from the barrel of a gun. And I'll stop right there. Yeah, that's what I was thinking is that uh, it almost acts as a rifling, kind of a the helical rifling to direct a particle and um, I think other people are picking up on this do directed energy weapon concept and um, it's uh, it's pretty well you think what what would happen with dealing with this much energy I mean what are you going to do with this kind of energy generating that kind of energy and of course the military applications are always at the top of the list when people invest money certainly and one of the, if you look at this strategically from a military standpoint, what would you do with a weapon like this? A great question. Um, you can, in my estimation, hold the world hostage. You have a weapon now that has effectively rendered all weapons, including nuclear weapons, obsolete. You have, in the parlance of Star Trek, a planet destroyer. This is real. This is factual. Going back 10 years at least in the literature that I've read in the military journals, they were stating at that time that they had a weapon 10 years ago that rendered nuclear devices obsolete. Now we are seeing that coming forth. It's out in the open. It's there if you choose to find it, if you choose to read it. Certainly, the people at CERN are not talking about this in a public forum, like their dance videos and whatnot that you're relating to. But it's there, and I have read the information where they have stated that this now has rendered nuclear warheads obsolete. So the nub of this issue is they can hold the world hostage and say, you need to get rid of all of your nuclear weapons, which we've seen that progression going on already for many years. We're seeing our president calling for the elimination, although he's in negotiations with Iran about their nuclear program, which is rather interesting. But that's all a smokescreen. That's all public consumption. That's all public fodder. That has nothing to do with what is really going on, and that is the fact that they now can say to every country, and remember, every country participates in CERN, so this is circular. They can now say to the world at large, which means you and me as the regular surf class person, as I like to put ourselves, that there will be the need for everyone to bow down 
to the New World Order, to the single government, to remove all sovereignties of all nations. There will be no nation states. There will be one world state under the auspices of the United Nations. And any country that defies that edict could suffer at the hands of a directed energy weapon upon their country, either in a very defined fashion in a small target with minimal collateral damage as a demonstration. And we have seen some information about that occurring in our country. I'll leave it up to the two of you if you want to delve into that demonstration. But I believe that this is leading to the signing of the seven-year peace treaty that is stated in Scripture. And again, I'll stop. Um, when Tim speaks of the areas that he's paying attention to in the mainstream media, be it television, movies, etc., you're looking at precognitive programming, meaning preparing people's minds to accept something that's coming at them from the future. You look at people walking around today on the streets focused on their phones. You see people in their homes focused on television. You are conditioning people to be connected to the Internet. If you cut off that, what does that do to them psychologically? And I'll let you tell Well, I agree with you, and it goes back to... Um, you know, Skynet, the whole discussion of Skynet that we have uh, had before. Do you guys still have me? I'm not sure. Yeah, if can yeah we, something. Okay. I can hear you. Good. Um, the Skynet is very real, and one of the things that ties into that, besides the fact that CERN can be used as a directed energy weapon, is Chris mentioned it a couple of times, and that's the uh, quantum computer. And I like to define the quantum computer because this is something that very few people are really talking about. And it, and it puzzles me to an extent, but also amuses me that very little mainstream media coverage, even in the computer um, magazines and publications, very little has been spoken of in terms of the adiabatic quantum computer. Now, this figures heavily in both of my books. Um, the reason that it does is because this sets us up for artificial intelligence. The computer model that came out this year that I don't want to say I predicted, it was an extrapolation mathematically of model numbers, 2048, I said in my book, 2048 Diamonds in the Rough, part of that title encompasses the say diabetic quantum computers model number, which 10 years ago was projected by the manufacturer to be introduced in early 2015. And I mentioned this in a previous conversation we've had, but just to reiterate, they announced the 2048 this year, but they failed to mention the other half of the um, specifications, and that is that they were going to achieve artificial intelligence in early 2015 with this computer. Their press release failed to mention that this year. The other part of that is the fact that that computer has the equivalent computational power, processing power, of all of the human minds on the planet combined, over 7 billion human brains. Now imagine how much computational power we have within our own head. I mean, science has said that it's nearly incomprehensible the ability of, for the brain to process information. If you multiply that by 7 billion, again, it's incomprehensible the capability of this single computer. Now, there are multiple generations of this computer, but to try to keep this short and focused, the purpose of this adiabatic quantum computer, which is not based on transistors, it is based on qubits, is to control the energy that is released by CERN during these collisions this year, and specifically the opening of the portal, because in 2012 when they attempted to open the portal, some say accidentally, there were giants, Nephilim, that appeared briefly 
coming through a dimensional portal such that they actually brought in the Swiss military and the local Swiss police into their jurisdiction, which is much like the Vatican City in the sense that no one is allowed into that jurisdiction unless they are invited. So why would they invite these outside forces? Well, they were panicked. The machine was shut down. The magnets were quenched. They were damaged. They were destroyed. Thus the shutdown and the rebuilding with new magnets. The point here is the adiabatic quantum computer is critical to the opening and controlling of the forces involved with this portal later this year, between September and December of this year. And we'll go into some of the dates in a minute. And at that time, they did have the early version of the adiabatic quantum computer, but they did not have the one that they have today. So it was a combination of things. One, they didn't have the computer to control what was going on with the Large Hadron Collider at that point. And therefore, I believe, number two, this was an accidental opening. But it gave them not only a glimpse into another dimension, but it gave them a glimpse of how much power do we really need to finally establish a fixed portal, not a temporary one. And we'll go into talking about that connection with Saturn and where that permanent opening and connection will take place. This is the descent. What they're doing is they are taking a, a problem, an equation. They call it a combinatorial programming problem. And as they describe it themselves, the manufacturer describes it openly, they are inserting the problem into another dimension. In that dimension, the problem is processed. The solution is then extracted from the other dimension back into our usable frame of reference in our dimension, if you will. Now, this has to do with quantum processing. It gets into quantum entanglement. It gets into, if you will, picture a mathematical problem operating or being processed by a tiny, tiny, tiny quantum-sized calculator. That calculator exists in another dimension, meaning in a quantum state you're dealing with as many as 11 dimensions, perhaps more. But there are acknowledged 11 dimensions. And so there's a direct correlation between running computations in another dimension and controlling an interdimensional portal. There's a direct crossover there. Again, you're taking the micro, the quantum, and you're dealing with the macro. Again, we love to say, as above, so as below. Actually, I, I picked this up from some of our conversations that we've had before, but the conclusion that I've come to, and this sounds so far-fetched, but I, I really want and encourage people to take away their preconceived notions, put away their prejudice, open up their mind, all of those things, and look at this through the lenses of spirituality. That is the other dimension we're talking about, the spiritual realm. Within Saturn itself, I believe, reside the spirits, the energies, the essence, if you will, that were thrown out of heaven, that they're imprisoned in Saturn. It sounds completely ridiculous. But when I look at the physics of what they're trying to accomplish and why are they targeting Saturn with the Large Hadron Collider by way of an electric plasma conduit, a heli helically shaped or helical shaped conduit, why target Saturn? What does it have? Well, it has the beings that they want to bring to Earth. And that's reflected in the ancient studies that you have brought forth. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful to. Now, Ceres coming into the picture, I think actually you can explain that better. I hate to put it back onto you, but I think you can explain Ceres from the ancient studies and the, and the gods that are involved, the gods that are involved with Ceres than I can, because that's not my area of expertise. But the timing is perfect because it is entering into our solar system and 
we do have a probe at Ceres, and we're watching it, and there has to be a connection with Saturn, as well as with Jupiter. It's Yes, um, it's interesting you mentioned the old Superman movie and the villains being trapped in the flat plane. That, I think, is a, a great example of Saturn. And essentially, that's where you know that symbolism crosses over from the movie to Saturn itself. There is so much tied in in the ancient studies to Saturn itself that it's obvious that they still worship Saturn and we see that in corporate logos all over the world that Saturn is reproduced over and over so we have to take this pragmatically rather than just simply discounting the notion that there are spirits contained within a gaseous globe with rings around it that we call a planet and simply say these people are nuts I'm speaking of myself being nuts. Mm -hmm. That may be the case, but I really I believe that if you if you look if you look at the facts, which is what they are doing in physics, what they are doing spiritually, and we're going to go into the dance routines in a minute. If you want to talk about people that are nuts, but they are worshiping. They're using the machine to worship spirits fallen angels, past entities, past gods, including Saturn itself. And they want to bring those entities to our plane of existence. Now as far as breaking physics, what they are trying to do, and I'm going to quote, and I won't cite the person, but this is coming from a physicist at CERN, they want to send us back to the beginning of time. So when you talk about breaking physics, let's talk about Einstein, relativity. Can you go back in time? Now, I don't go into time and time warps and time travel in any of my books and publications. Um, I let other people deal with that. But is, is CERN a time machine? That's a question that's been put forth. I don't even deal with it. I, I won't even go there. It's possible, certainly. But it detracts, I think, from what we are trying to focus on, so I don't go into it. But they are essentially trying to recreate the, what they call the Big Bang, the moment of creation. They're trying to create their own moment of creation. Mm -hmm. So if they are doing that, they have to have three things. They have to have the Trinity. And let me stop there because I know you want to talk about what the Trinity means and the mirror, the replicating, the, the mimicking that they do. So go ahead and jump in if you wanted to say something on the Trinity. Sure, be happy to. Um, there have been some misunderstandings of the startup date. So I'm going to define first of all what does it mean to start up the machine and then we'll go to the dates. The machine has a complicated process of multiple accelerators leading to the main ring. They have a straight line linear accelerator feeding into smaller circular synchrotron accelerators, all feeding higher and higher speeds of particles circulating in one direction around small synchrotrons that then feed into the main ring when those accelerated particles, let's just call them beams, are injected into the main ring they then op, um, are in opposing directions, they circulate around the ring in opposite directions thus creating the opportunity for a collision to occur within a detector. The Collision occurs when the beams are crossed. Now you've heard that in Ghostbusters. Okay, <laughs> don't cross the stream. Okay, I love love the movies with the step Almost. pyramid, with the step pyramid and the yes. oh, everything yeah. up there. <laughs> that, movie, that movie is so occult it's not even funny. But anyway, let, let's get back to the crossing of the streams within the detectors. That's where the collisions occur. That's where the energies are, are derived from. So, 
when they talk about starting the machine, you have to keep in mind that there are multiple machines leading up to and accelerating particles into the main ring. The dates that I'm going to provide to you are focused on the main ring, not the other machines leading up to it. These dates come from their published public calendar. You can go to my website, anthonypatch.com, go to the top, click, click on the tab Images 2. It will then show you an image of one of the detectors, one, an image many people have seen. Looks like the sun, looks like Shiva. You click on that picture, it will open the link to the PDF. You can open the PDF and look at the calendar. I'll tell you right now, it's confusing. You have to go all the way to the very beginning of the calendar and look at the specific dates because the heading of the month on the top of the calendar is shifted to the left. Meaning if you take the month and go down the line into the dates, the block of dates and weeks, it'll throw you off. So anyway, just carefully examine it. Let me give you some dates. This is on my home page of my uh, website. March 25th, not the 23rd, not the 20th, not the 13th, not the 15th. Those are all misreadings of what machine are we talking about and when is it starting. Again, main ring, these are the dates. March 25th, the main ring will be commissioned. I'll define that. Commissioning means they've gone through all of the injection testing sending beams around in one direction only and then in two directions opposing without collisions without the crossover inside the detectors taking place just circulating beams going around when they say we we're going to commission the beam on the 25th the main ring is now clean it's now cold and it has circulated successfully confined, defined streams of particles without any uh, strain of the beam to the inner walls of the tubular ring itself. They are, have a clean process. And I'll stop there in case you have questions. You're speaking of the last accelerator, the last small ring synchrotron accelerator has a stack of four rings four rings on top of one another. Um, this then combines into two streams going in opposite directions. Remember I talked about the beam lines that radiate out from the synchrotron machines? These are essentially two beam lines coming off of this stack of four small ring synchrotron and they then take from that those two streams and circulate it in the main single layer, single tube main ring. So the main ring is like the uh, an, an inflatable inner tube in a tire. One inner tube. The one just before that had four inner tubes stacked on top of one another. You have the ability to accelerate progressively these particles and so it's like a um, it's, what's the best way to put it? It's a compounding of the acceleration. So you have the ability to take one ring and accelerate to a, an energy level and then compound that energy level as you go up through the stacks of rings to where you can finally take that maximum power of all four rings combined and inject that into the main ring. Okay, and so after it's in the main ring, what happens after that? Well, to date, there have not been any collisions that have taken place in the main ring. They're trying to keep it clean, therefore they're not performing those collisions. Um, they've done low power testing collisions. I should back up a little bit. Very low power uh, tests just to calibrate the detectors. But when they go to full commission, that means the tube is clean of the particles, zero energy, and 
a temperature that is lower than outer space itself. And that means they're ready for collisions to take place at higher levels. Now those higher level collisions, the first date, and I'm going to define dates now. We define co collisions, we define commissioning. Now when we talk about the uh, the dates on the calendar, if you go to that PDF, you will see that there are what I call blocks of dates. You're not having a collision take place on one day as a single occurrence. You are seeing anywhere from um, 10 days to two weeks to three weeks as blocks of experiments that are taking place with different types of particles. And therefore, when I'm citing these dates to you, these are the beginning points of a block of dates and a block of experiments contained within those blocks of dates. Well, they've done the beam tests, and some of this is defined on their calendar. They'll have labels on there where these things are pointed out. But the commissioning was testing of the beam, um, doing some low-level and then progressively higher-level collisions, but they're nothing close to the types of energies I'm going to cite that will start in June. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, maybe it's too early for me to ask this question. Uh, did you want to continue with what's going to go in June first before we add? Uh, I wanted to ask about earthquakes, but do you want to hold off on that one? Yeah, let's hold off on that. Um, we can bring that back just to maintain some continuity of the, the timing because the media focuses on dates and starting times, alternative media as well as mainstream. So when we're talking about something that is going to generate high levels of energy, energy higher than what they achieved prior to the emergency shutdown that we mentioned earlier, June 17th. June 17th is when they will have an intensity ramp up. And I want you to focus on that intensity ramp up. This is what is going on throughout the year leading up to the end of the year. I won't go into this, the, the machinery of it because I covered it before. But suffice it to say that they are stair-stepping up in their um, intensity of the speed at which the particles are colliding as well as the ramping up of the energies that they will derive from these collisions. June 17th they will achieve 17 TeV. That's tera electron volts. Tera meaning trillion. So you have 17 trillion electron volts that will be achieved at the beginning of this block of time and block of experiments that will continue ramping up from 17 to higher and higher levels of energy. The, let me back up, I'm sorry. I apologize to my audience. 7 TeV, not 17. 7 TeV will be the starting point on June 17th. That's where my crossover for me was. Um, June 17th, 7 TeV will be the starting point of the ramping up of energy, um, increasing in their intensity to July 24th. July 24th, they will achieve, as a, again, a starting point of a new block of experiments in a new block of weeks, 13 TeV. Now what is critical within 13 TeV is that they will move from 7 to 13 crossing a threshold at 10. 10 TeV is the threshold at which strangelets are produced and they will be produced within the ALICE detector. So I'm not trying to overload people, I want to just stop there before I go to the next date. But again, we are talking about a ramping up of, of power. But I want to define what it means by 10 TeV, trillion, seven, or 7 trillion tera electron volts. 
that is actually the mass of the particle. Now follow me on this because this is a little bit you know a little bit difficult for some people who've never read this before. This is a inverting of Einstein's theory, or, uh, equation that everybody is familiar with. E equals mc squared. They are now taking E equals mc squared. They're taking the E at the beginning and replacing it with the M, which is mass. You now have M equals E C squared. C is speed, the speed of light squared. M is mass. E is energy. They have reversed the process. What I'm getting at here is that you can take a particle and accelerate it to 99.99% the speed of light, but it doesn't matter how much more energy, electrical energy, that you put behind that particle you're accelerating. Because you can never, according to Einstein's theory of relativity, you can never exceed the speed of light with mass, with a particle, with a solid object. But they will continue to accelerate these even though they know they cannot exceed the speed of light. What's the point here? The point is the more energy you pump into a particle, you can never accelerate it faster. You reach a sound barrier, if you will, or a light barrier. The energy you're pumping into that particle in an attempt to accelerate it causes the particle to expand, to gain in mass, the tera electron volts is a representation of the increased mass of the particles. These particles are becoming heavier and denser. The more energy that the main ring, the accelerator, is providing to it. They are creating particles that have never existed in nature. The energy that is derived from those collisions is higher than has ever existed as created by man. They are replicating the energies that come from a black hole. They are rep replicating the energy that is emanating in the, in the form of a burst or a burster as it is called in astronomy. Synchrotron energies that emanate, that radiate in two opposite directions out of a black hole. I need to stop because I'm sure you need to digest and ask questions and we can go back over this if you need to. But I have one more date to go. What they're accelerating amongst many, many, and I'll keep it very simple because there's a list of about 12 different types of particles that they actually will be colliding this year. Pro protons are being collided and then protons with other particles are being collided. Later this year, they will use ions of lead, which they have used in conjunction with protons, but they will take lead and lead and circulate it in opposite directions and smash lead together. They're not creating new particles. They're just creating particles that have greater mass. So they're taking energy and converting it to mass. When you look at a, an atomic bomb, an atomic bomb is creating energy by splitting mass. Here we have the combining, if you will, or the increasing of mass to create energy. Again, the inverse of E equals MC squared. Yeah. Sure. Let, let's go back to our analogy of the inflatable inner tube for a tire. Within that inner tube, you have the circulating beams that are held to the center of that circle. So if, if you look at a cross section of the inner tube, it's a circle. In the center of the circle is the beam that is circulating. The reason that the beam stays in the circle is because of the magnets. The magnets are creating energy to confine those beams. Again, go back to um, Ghostbusters, confine the stream. That's what they're doing with the magnets, is confining what would ordinarily be a beam that would just scatter particles all through the, the inside of the inner tube. So 
inside that inner tube you have four major locations that have detectors and these are the things that you see the pictures of when people have put up photographs of CERN and these elaborate ra radial or circular arrayed devices that's the cross-section of the detectors the detectors are multiples of detectors arrayed in a circle all focused towards the center point the center point of the detector is where the beam passes through so you have a very very small let's call it a hair hair follicle diameter beam going through your rubber inner tube and at different points four different points or more than that but four major detectors like the Alice detector that have the ability to allow those two streams of beams, two opposite circulating beams that normally would just pass by each other. Okay? Within, go back to the cross section of the inner tube. Instead of one beam, you have two because they're circulating and they're going by one another, but at some point they cross over. So you have two inner tubes and I know I may be confusing people, but you have two inner tubes, two beams within what is called the main ring. At some point you take the two inner tubes and you cross them over, allowing the beam within each inner tube to strike one another. And that's where the collision occurs within the detector, in the center point of the detector. And they're much like cameras. That's an easy way to define or describe this array of detectors. It's like you're taking photographs of the particles and the energy, but the particles specifically in those wild patterns of colors and different um, patterns of, of trajectories of these particles. You're seeing photographs, and that's a simplistic description, but photographs of those particles after the collision occurs inside the detector. So it's like a spark. Exactly. And this is what they call the big... Go back again. March 25th, the commissioning of the beam. So now it's ready for its first collisions, or high-level collisions. June 17th, they will achieve, in their higher collisions, they will achieve 7 TeV, which is higher than the machine, do almost double the power of what they achieved in 2012, um, where it was 4 TeV. So we're looking at 7 now. July 24th, we will see 13 TeV. November 20th, they will achieve 14. Now, let me back up a little bit to September because it does operate, it does have collisions occurring in the month of September. It just won't be up to 14 TeV at that point. It could. Again, I have to couch things a little bit because they're not revealing everything in public in terms of the power levels and the dates of those power levels, but starting in September, October, and November. September, October, November, they will be colliding ions of lead particles, lead to lead collisions mm. in the main ring. So their highest power they're shooting for in September and certainly continuing again blocks of experiments all the way out almost to Christmas. And they will be shutting down just prior to Christmas. So, so September, absolutely. Go ahead. So this tablet that goes back to the Wizard of Oz and the Green Emerald City, mm -hmm. all of that occultic stuff. But yes, lead to gold. There was an article came out last year. It was rather sort of tongue in cheek by the scientific authors of the articles, but they were saying openly, yes, we have converted lead into gold at CERN. And some people in the audience may have heard that that story. These are these are microscopic particles of gold. I think you, people need to appreciate that. But yes, we are actually talking about the age-old alchemic goal of turning lead into gold. Is that the purpose of the collisions of the lead-to-lead -lead particles? No, it's it's a spin-off. It, it really doesn't have that much to do with anything. But it does demonstrate that they are achieving tremendous amounts of power that can go to the quantum level and redefine the structure at the quantum level of an atom. 
and therefore you can manipulate at the quantum level the quantum particles and create any type of atom that you choose. They can create gold, they can create silver, they can create anything on the periodic table and then beyond the periodic table because they do have with these higher energies the ability to manipulate the, the particles, the, the, the structure of our atoms. So when we talk about muons, gluons, quarks, boson, Higgs boson, we're talking about shifting those around using the building blocks to create whatever you want. Yeah, and that I'll just right, stop. and and all these all these things are interconnected. There's so much complexity to the interweaving of all, all of these things that in the in the science realm, the reason for the lead to lead is because of the density of lead, and if the denser the particle stripped of its electrons, creating an ion of lead, the higher the energy that you can achieve. That's a simple explanation. So they're taking what we have as the heaviest particles, slamming them together. And therein lies the power that they need to establish a portal, a fixed portal, a permanent portal at the 14 plus tera electron volt level. You now have lead that has 14 times its resting mass. Resting mass is when it is not accelerated, it's at rest, there's no, no energy imparted on it to cause it to move. It is now 14 times heavier because of the energy that has been pushed or pumped into it to accelerate it to 99.99% the speed of light. Again, you are creating mass by using the energy from... Easy way to say it is, we've tried it with the lighter particles, the protons, and then up through another dozen or so other particles, getting certain things that they want out of those intermediate collisions throughout the year. But the goal is let's open that portal and it, they know now how, what type of energy they need. They know that because of what happened in 2012. So this, this it is and that's where it gets a little bit murky for me because I'm not quite sure what they intend to do with this other than I go back to my strange lips again and it's kind of the drum that I keep beating but they are creating strange lips at that intermediate level of 10 Tera electron volts, which occurs July 24th. Strangelets are produced at 10 TeV. I believe that they are creating in tandem with this increase in mass of the lead particles, they're creating more strangelets. This is a ramping up of the production of strangelets. That's the quick summation of what they're doing in tandem with opening the portal. Because you cannot escape the fact that the strangelets are being produced. It was proven last year, published in August of last year, Brookhaven Laboratory using their muon magnet. They accelerated and briefly achieved 10 TeV and created some small quantities of strangelets. That was a proof of concept test, proof of concept experiment that they took that process and transferred it to the Large Hadron Collider and CERN will never admit to the title of strangelets they always talk about they are yes creating a condensate a condensate of quark gluons within the Alice detector but they will not hang the name strangelet on it because they fear the same media backlash that they got when people were talking about the creation of microscopic black holes with the collider. And everybody, including Hawking, was up in arms about black holes being created. And he's right, they are creating black holes. But they're microscopic and they tend to wink out of existence very quickly. Now at these higher energy levels, yes, there is the possibility of black holes but they will not use the name strangelets because of the backlash that they will get 
when people start saying strain slits are like black holes. I call them a cousin to the black hole because they're heavy and dense like a black hole, but they don't have that density and that gravity that a black hole have. But they attract energy and they attract light and they attract atoms to themselves like a black hole does. And I need to stop there. Just a little bit to the gold just for a moment. Remember I talked about the third strand of DNA and that third strand being coated in a nano-thin coating of gold. And the purpose of that gold in that third strand application is for the imparting or the digitizing of information into the DNA. So when you say about the mask and you talk about the tears, you're talking about the transformation, the ge genetic manipulation. And we see a lot of the deities as um, chimera, the, the mixing of the animal and human form. And therefore, the gold represents that process of genetic manipulation comprised of the third strand of DNA, which is the alien DNA, which will be utilized in the resurrection of the beast, which is something we'll get into a little bit later. But to go back to phosphorus, you're talking... Essentially, phosphorus is one of what they call quant quantum dots. Quantum dots are luminous. They are like a, um, you know, when you use luminous paint, uh, like in Halloween and things like that for costumes, the glow-in-the-dark paints. Luminous glow-in-the-dark paints are quantum dots at the quantum level that are used to identify different um, subatomic particles at the quantum level so that they're easier to track and easier to model, especially when they're using high-powered x-rays like at Berkeley with the synchrotron to create protein models. So the phosphorus ties right back into DNA genetic manipulation. All of that is handled by the quantum computer. The quantum computer is tied to CERN not only in the processing of um, digital information to control the portal, but also once the portal is open to the control of the spirits coming to and then imparting those spirits onto bodies, onto host bodies. Now this gets into the deception, the physicists believing they're going to become immortal gods. Some of them believe that they are going to be possessed by these spirit so that they will achieve godlike immortality, but also in previous videos we've talked about the creation of hybrids that are waiting to be hosts, to be receptacles for these incoming spirits. So the adiabatic quantum computer has multiple applications depending on the time frame of what's going on with the machine. So you have it controlling the machine, you have it controlling the opening of the portal, you have it controlling the conduit from Saturn of these energies, these spirits coming through the portal into our dimension. And then you have the ability to create a beast from genetic manipulation of artificial three-strand DNA, creating the image of the beast and controlling that image because this will be artificial, it will be holographic, it won't be a laser projection but it is holographic in the sense that it is a computer-generated, grown-from-three-strand artificial DNA human figure. The human figure, there was an article came out today in which the author was saying the smashing of particles together will, will merge spirit and physics, spirit and physical, creating a beast. That's very simplistic. I've just explained to you the more sophisticated process that is taking place, and that's the genetic manipulation and growing of that DNA using the quantum computer to do that to create this new beast. And the, the computer will control that beast. Go ahead. I, no, I think... Exactly, and I don't want to step on Chris, but just to complete the thought, yes, definitely, these are avatars that will receive the spirits. When you talk about biology, again, we have to define biology in a new way. Biology, when we think of biology in the common high school and, 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 and 
college level biology courses that we've taken, we think of things that grow, things that grow from nature, things that grow from um, cells, from mitochondria. Okay, You go to the quantum level, you are now moving out of the standard model of physics and biology to the quantum level where the standard model does not apply, therefore you have new rules, new things that govern the behavior of those building block quantum particles, like the Higgs boson. Okay, When we define biology in the framework of quantum physics, of quantum studies, we have to call it quantum biology, because you are creating a new form of biology. You are taking the quantum particles, the, bar, the building blocks, that create the proteins, that create the mitochondria, that create the cells that grow. So if you start with the building blocks, you go to the chemicals, you go to the elements, and you manipulate those at that level and stack the blocks differently, you create a new biology, you create a new life form, and that life form begins to grow. Now, does it have a spirit? Does it have, is it something of God? Is it, does it have a soul? Does it have a consciousness? That's a different discussion, but focusing on the process, we're looking at creating new biology. Remember a few weeks ago we had the gentleman who was talking about this very process, the doctor who was at NASA Ames talking to the other physicists back in 2009. They were Venter. talking. Yeah, Venter, Venter. wasn't it? Yeah. Yes, Craig, Craig, Dr. Craig Venter. This is what we have to do: is define biology in the new world of quantum studies. Go ahead, Chris. You want to chime in, or um, or do you, um, Yeah, I had some more questions on it. Um, but. I'm glad that he's coming around to understanding that God exists and God's the creator. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but, but I do think that's the direction he's going. But in that I talk about panspermia, and, and to define that again, we're talking about the theory that we come from the stars, that somehow on meteors, on asteroids, there were the, um, the, imp, the our DNA, keeping it simple, our DNA was on these um, moving bodies that collided with Earth and therefore started life on Earth. And I'm sorry, I'm not, a, I don't buy into it. Is it possible? Is it probable? Is it of God? Could it be a process that God created? Sure, why not? I mean, we can go there if you need to, but that's what pan panspermia is, and it is directed evolution by man now. That most definitely, this is where we're at. We're at directed evolution. <laughs> I'm more the comic relief, I think. I mean. <laughs> no, this is beautiful, but you are right. Okay, so let me define for the audience. Strange lips, they're cap they, not only their capability to attract other atoms to themselves is one of their crossovers to black holes, but they are the heaviest part particles known. Are we losing Chris? Oh. No. I lost okay. my pen. I, I try to write things down so I don't lose my train of thought. Go ahead. Anyway, um, they attract atoms to themselves, but they're also the heaviest known particles. And they are artificial. They're created at the Large Hadron Collider. And because they are so heavy, they, quote, fall to the center of the Earth. Now, relating to the Superman story, the planet Krypton, that could be, you know, predictive programming if you want. But strangelets, when they go to the core of the planet, depending on the number of strangelets, the quantity of strangelets that go to the core, will de determine the time frame for the potential, I under underscore, emphasize, potential conversion of the planet at some point to a neutron star. Now, this is in the open internet information. I'm, this isn't anything I'm making up. The point here is that when CERN fires off in September, October, November 
at their highest energy level, 14 TeV. Does that mean we're going to convert the planet to a neutron star? No. I want to emphasize that. No. They could create sufficient quantities over a certain period of time to achieve that conversion to a neutron star of the planet if that was their goal. But in my estimation, we're looking at something that could take as long as 100 years for that conversion to take place. Now, I'm going to jump back to Tim wanting to talk about earthquakes. Definitely, strangelets can cause earthquakes. They cause it because of the attraction of material, the planet material, the atoms at the core, attracting that to themselves and exponentially growing in size within the core. So you are, if you want, consuming material, it's eating the planet from the inside out, to put it in a strange form. If you're going to do that, if you're going to convert the planet, obviously it's going to have repercussions on the surface, on the crust, on the tectonic structure of the planet. And the planet's already expanding because of the increasing energies that the core is receiving in the, electric, the model of the electric universe. We're seeing earthquakes right now because the planet is growing in size. It's expanding and separating the tectonic plates. They're not subducting. They're expanding. The strangelets can cause an increase in earthquakes. The other thing that is already causing an increase in earthquakes are the magnets themselves within CERN. And there's a direct correlation between the time frames in which they have previously brought their magnets, their superconducting magnets, up to full power. Back in 2012, 2011, 2010, we saw significant earthquakes, meaning 6.5, 7.0s, and 8s, corresponding either on the day or the day after the activation of the magnets within CERN. That's very controversial, but Certainly, within the framework of what they're doing, there's a direct correlation. Go ahead. What are we trying to achieve here? In the big picture, the ultimate goal, where are we going with this whole thing? Let's go to the video. Um, what was the video of concern with the dancing? What was that called? Sim symmetry. Symmetry. Thank you. In symmetry, they show, and one of the guys out there, is doing a great job of showing what and taking apart in that video and showing what's going on. What's his name again? The website we've been looking at. Is it is it face like round the sun? Saturn? No, round Saturn's oh. eye. Round Saturn's eye. Excellent work. Excellent work on mm -hmm. symmetry. The point here is in that video they show desolation. They show the the dry lake bed. They show the circle. They show the dancer within the circle. The circle is, you know, of course it's going to be the Large Hadron Collider, it's CERN, but we're talking about big picture. The desolation, go to Shiva, go to the Hindu god, the statue at CERN. There's a lot of reasons for that, but one of the things we need, again, we're defining a lot of things today. Let's define Shiva. Shiva is well known as the god of destroyer, of destruction. That's what everybody's talking about. However, she is also the one that creates desolation. Desolation translated to a clean sheet of paper, starting over, starting from scratch. Again, quantum biology, going to the physics of what's going on. When you collide these particles, you are starting with the big bang within the machine the point of the creation of the universe. The dance is replicating that within symmetry, that desolation of the dry, dry lake bed. Destroy the planet, destroy what we have, start over with a clean sheet of paper and create a new Garden of Eden, a new heaven on earth, through their physics and through their quantum biology and through the new beings, the new race of beings that will inhabit this new terraformed planet 
that they're trying to create. It's all in that video. It's in our face. Can I ask you another question regarding what you just That's the holographic beast. That's the beast that they're creating. And the, the, the desolation is all in scripture. I mean, this is all crossing over to each frame of reference. So ultimately, the big picture, what they're trying to do is they're trying to create heaven on earth. They're trying to kill God, trying to kill God's angels. This is the battle of Armageddon. They are trying to start over, and I love to use this word, and I'm going to use it again, hubris. Again, NASA does a lot of the preliminary legwork for CERN in terms of research and development and machinery, and NASA is tied in with the Department of Energy, which essentially is the administrator for all of these colliders, these labs all over the United States. But NASA, obviously, they're focused on what's going on in the big picture out in the cosmos. And they're all about Jupiter and Saturn. And they know full well what is going on. And you look at all of the occult symbology, symbolism that they use in their mission patches on the astronauts' uniforms and that they put on their websites. All of this stuff is tied into the occult. NASA is nothing more than an occult research entity that is taking the spiritual and merging it with the physical. All of this, when we talk about, I'm going off on a tangent, when you talk about Egyptian gods and you talk about the comet, we talk about all of these different ancient entities. They represent physical particles. You talk about a god that represents iron. You have a direct connection between spiritual and physical. The spiritual in the form of gods, entities, symbolism. Physics in the form of the periodic table of elements. The two are connected. Why do they hang all of these occult names and labels and symbols and statues on a physical machine or on spacecraft at NASA and satellites and probes because the two are connected. They play off each other. They work off each other. They have to have each other. You cannot look at the world and our universe and our frame of reference solely through the eyes of physics or solely through the eyes of spiritual. You have to merge the two. When we talk about waking people up, we're waking them up to this, the merging of physics, what we call our reality, what we can touch, and what we cannot touch, which is the spiritual. And until people understand that they have to take in the spiritual component of this, the occult spiritual as well as our Christian beliefs in the spiritual, and pull the two together. If you want to smash particles together, if you want to collide something, in your head, you have to collide those two frames of reference to our world, spiritual and physical. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is, is they believe in the wrong spiritual. I mean, um, yep. The, you know, the let's shift gears a little bit. Okay, let's change the energy up a little bit. Tomorrow is the eclipse, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Let me, let me stop you there. Wait until we talked about the magnets and the magnetosphere. Okay. You think you saw some northern lights. Wait until they open up the magnetosphere and the magnetopause, which is out further, when they connect to Saturn with this plasma conduit. It's going to light up the whole planet in northern wow. lights. Wow. You mean it's, it's going to be really just wild looking, just the difference of... Uh, um, yeah, and the, so everybody's being exposed to high levels of radiation then at that time, right? If, uh, if oh yeah, yep. Because you're gonna you're gonna open the shower curtain. There's your shower head. Let's mm -hmm. go to the shower curtain. You open the shower curtain, and now you're going to be bombarded by everything that we've been protected by our shields from, from the sun and from other areas in the solar system. The energy that normally we don't encounter. Gamma rays and covert catastrophe. The opening of my book yeah. is Mar Markarian 421. Yeah. Black hole, a burster, gamma rays. Mm -hmm. First mm -hmm. time Earth directed at that highest energy level. 
that's exactly what we're talking about gamma ray energy coming in through the shields and affecting us um, as far as this event what are you expecting to see with this uh, I know we're in March uh, we saw DEFCON 3 this week was reported oh, yeah. uh, we're, we're back to DEFCON 4 okay I checked it out okay. with no explanation major mobilization of Russian troops all over creation and major grandstanding by the the uh, United States moving their things around. Um, as we approach CERN 10 TEV, are we just going to be bombarded with nonstop distractions, uh, or are we going to be watching blood sacrifices to their goddess at CERN as they open these new energies, or what? Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. I'm going to answer that by saying in Scripture we are compelled to keep our eyes on Israel. That Israel is the timepiece for what will play out in God's plan as presented in Scripture. So as we watch the re-election of Netanyahu this week and we see the threat of Iran and our government's involvement in setting up a treaty relative to their nuclear program in Iran and the existential threat that poses to the existence of Israel. I'll throw it right out. I think we will see at least Isaiah and we will see not at Ezekiel 38 and 39 that comes later but we are going to see the destruction of Damascus, Damascus overnight we are going to see a major Middle East conflict take place with Israel fighting its immediate surrounding or in scripture compassed nations surrounding Israel that's Syria that's Jordan right now Jordan's kind of our friend their friend but Jordan's on there, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Egypt. We have those countries right now directly involved with Israel and unfortunately that is the, I think, the battle that is going to happen this year. And that will cause such disruption in the internet, in our way of life, and such a disruption and distraction that we will not care or even think about CERN anymore. Will that be June, July, August, September? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I just I, think it's going to happen this year. I think Israel you're making the Middle East. Yeah, you're, you're making a good point. Uh, stated agenda of the Illuminati, um, and that is to bring conflict to the world, so that brother is fighting against brother, and create the massive deaths that they want to achieve and so that is what we're seeing it doesn't matter about politics it doesn't matter about who the leader is of any country at this point it's the conflict that matters and that's what they want they want to create that conflict treaties it's all smokescreen it doesn't matter it's all intermediate stuff but yes I agree with you um, it's God's plan he knows from the beginning, and he knows right now, and he knows in the end. So, you know, that's where I put my trust and my faith is in he knows what's going on, whether we're talking about CERN or the Middle East or our present administration. Now, I want to echo, Tim, what you said about the aborted baby, babies because I'm adopted. I was adopted at birth. So that's a very sensitive issue for me. It's, it's incredible that we are still here as a nation after these outright murders that have taken place of babies and it to me it's nothing but demonic that activity anyway I'll get off my soapbox go ahead guys to encourage people you know one of the questions came up is who's controlling CERN who's, mm -hmm. who's, who's really running this who's behind the scenes we can call it Illuminati, the elite, the banksters. Um, we can 
call it the corporations, we can say the United Nations is running the whole thing. Ultimately, it's Satan that's involved in all this, and we have said that repeatedly. But who on this planet is running the agenda at CERN? It's not the physicists and the engineers, obviously. They are just the worker bees who are creating this hive. In my estimation, it is the elite ruling class behind the scenes, ultimately. We talk about the, the hidden societies that are out there. Um, they are the ones that are dictating why CERN exists and why every country in the world is participating in CERN. It is a tool. We've said that repeatedly. The question was posed to me by an email from, from one of our viewers. What about God and CERN? Will God stop CERN? And my reply was, it would only take about a 4.0 earthquake because it's a very fragile machine. And if an earthquake were to strike CERN Switzerland of a moderate magnitude, it would effectively knock it offline. Is that God's plan? I don't know. I don't know. But it could happen. This whole thing that we're talking about could be a moot point tomorrow or September. It could never happen. And I'm completely open to that. But it's up to what God wants to do. We can divine the scriptures if we want. We can look at scriptures. We can say that maybe this is a part of the tool, mm -hmm. uh, a tool that is a part of scripture, opening the bottomless pit. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Amen to that. And um, that's what this is all about. You and me, the three of us, and others like us, we are servants. We are servants of the Lord. Tim and I have shared privately that we have been through the stripping down, as I call it, the stripping down process in our lives. And we have come to the point where we are nothing more than humble ser servants. So we're not prophets. We're here just to pass on what we believe is information that has been shared with us and we've been enlightened to, if you will. And we hope that it helps people to come to Christ. A quick plug, okay? Okay, sure thing. Now, I, I had a gentleman sent me a comment on one of my videos and he said you're just, in essence, he said you're just doing this to sell books. Number one, I'm not. Number two, the books are terribly inexpensive as a download. They're five dollars, the Science Companion is two dollars. I'm not making any money here. That's not the point in all of this. It's just sharing the information. I've given away 90% of my books to people that if they will email me at anthonypatchauthor.com or at gmail.com, anthonypatchauthor at gmail.com, and say, could I have your books for free? Sure. Absolutely. I'll send them to you. Because I'm just a servant passing on information. I'm not here to make money off this. Now, I do want to make a plug for a gentleman who has come into my life who has extended an incredible invitation to me to help in this information spreading. And we're doing this at cost. In fact, I'm sure we're going to lose money on the deal, but it doesn't matter. Clyde Lewis, the host of Ground Zero Radio, he broadcasts to 250 independent stations across the nation. He's right here in Portland. I'm going to give you a snapshot of the backstory on this. He didn't know me from Adam. He was doing a number of shows regarding CERN. He had his producer do a web search, found me. She calls me and says, in, with four hours lead time, can you be on the show at 8 o'clock tonight? Can you call in? I said, well, isn't your studio here in Portland? Yeah, where are you? Well, I'm in Portland. I mean, this is just phenomenal. So anyway, I go down to the studio, meet Clyde, immediate great chemistry. The man is humble, super intelligent, outspoken, driven, believes in taking the best direction in life for everybody and sharing the message with everybody to help everybody. This man is super dedicated to helping people. 
So we had a great four-hour discussion on the radio. You can listen to it on my website if you like. The point is on the 28th of this month, on March 28th, at the Hilton Hotel in Portland, Glide has graciously created a venue for me to speak with him from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock in the evening on Saturday the 28th at the Hilton in Portland. The tickets are $15 ahead, $20 if you purchase them at the door. Again, we're not making any money off this. This is an opportunity for people to meet Clyde in person. If they want, they can meet me for whatever that's worth. But the point is we're going to talk about a lot of the things that we've talked about in these Google Hangouts in a very encapsulated form for three hours. The reason we're doing this is we hope that it will be broadcast nationwide, that the mainstream media will pick this up, not to sell the books. I'm giving the books away for free at this event. I'm not bringing books to sell. Okay, This is not about me. I'm trying to get this across to people. This is about Jesus Christ and what he wants to get out to people so that they will turn to him. Not fear-mongering. This is about wake up, see the agenda, look at the nonsense that's going on, realize where the truth is, and that is with Jesus Christ. So come out 28th, if you can make it to Portland, I'll meet you, I'll greet you, Clyde will do the same, and we're going to have some fun with it because God has a sense of humor. Absolutely. Listen live. It's on his home um, page. You can click in on uh, Ground Zero's webpage, and you can find his live broadcasts that way as well. We hope to do a live broadcast as well of this event, but we'll see what's going to, you know, come out as far as the technical side of it. So the day was what again? It's the 28th, which is Saturday, 28th of March, from 6 to 9 p.m. at the Hilton Hotel in Portland, Oregon. We are nine days. Top. We got nine, nine days. days. Yeah, go ahead. No, we're on the top floor. The Skyline Room looks out over the city. Absolutely incredible view of the city. This is a premier venue. We're throwing whatever it takes to put this together. Again, we won't make a dime off it. That's not the point. We're doing this to get the information out to people. We are, Clyde and I are sincere about this. He and I have bonded like I can't believe, and I've never met the man before. This is clearly the Lord's working. Amen. Clearly, he is putting this together. So you folks, I'm pulling your stuff in. I'm citing you guys by name, by websites, all of down the line, because it's the three of us being represented at this, along with Clyde. This is not me. This is the three of us doing the Lord's work. And we'll try to get Chris to do a little intro thing uh, if Clyde wants one. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can you hold that for just a second? Uh-huh. Come back. Just one more. Come back. So you're saying that in the fourth dynasty was the golden age. No, go forward. Fourth mm -hmm. dynasty was considered the golden age. Mm -hmm. And that was between 2613 to 2494. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hang on, hang on before you go too far. You said that the constellations changed their position during that uh, fourth dynasty. Yes. Okay, that's really important if we relate that to the Thunderbolts project and the alignment of Saturn, Venus, and Mars in close proximity to the Earth. That's when they referred to that alignment at that time as the Golden Age. That alignment was before the constellations and the planets themselves changed position to what we see today. So you just, yeah. pinpoint, you just pinpointed the date of the Golden Age before everything shifted. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Outstanding, outstanding work. So all, yeah, through, uh, all through history, the, the swastika has been worshipped, and we've seen the flip side or the inverse of the swastika presented in different cultures. But all through history, they have been seeking the opening of the portal is what the, rep, the representation of the of the swastika means to people and the fact yeah. that you've pointed out that it rotates and specifically rotates around Polaris which is our navigation star, our primary north star for navigation. Everything that we know in the world is based on 
navigation by Polaris, which is the center of the hub of the rotating swastika, which opens the portal. Yeah. That's mind blowing. You are yeah. right on top of it, baby. Mm -hmm. Like we talked about it the last time, <clears throat> your your images here tell the whole story. This is the whole thing right here, folks. I want you to understand what she's presenting. This is a graphical representation of the process and the machine at CERN. This goes back to the golden age, but it shows the components in in an in a ancient representation. It shows the components of the Large Hadron Collider <clears throat> and its orientation to the moon. And what it is showing you is the connection, pardon my voice, it's showing you the connection that will be established, an electrical connection between the Earth and the moon. And this is reestablishing a connection that occurred during the time of the Golden Age, and as Chris has identified, during the Fourth Dynasty. And this all ties into the... Uh, Kabbalah tree here, representing the same thing that you're seeing in the middle image. The middle image is the whole the whole game, right there, and that's also an image that was provided to us by the Thunderbolts project, showing the alignment of the moon, and uh, as well, <clears throat> we have uh, Venus and Mars and Saturn. So that's where we're headed with this. Chris, you just really, again, hit it right out of the ballpark, right here. Yeah, yeah. this... Slide, the Well of Souls. Tim, okay, you're a popular culture guy. Um, we're talking about uh, Indiana Jones. Do you remember in the Well of Souls? <clears throat> and then he places the staff <clears throat> with the with the medallion on the top of it and the, the rays of the sun come through into the right. chamber. Yeah. Um, if we were to do the same thing with this um, this navel, this this well of souls, the, the navel of the universe, and place the staff in that, I'm just, my thought here is that it probably points right to, um, well, now Polaris. What do you think? If we look at that stone, <clears throat> excuse me, much like a sextant for navigation, then that, to me, that hole, that navel, has to point to the North Star. Hmm. That's, a, that's, a, that's a good point, especially if, we, if that's what it reflects, the as above, so below. Yeah, because it points to the North Star above, but it points to the well of souls below, below it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this is and this is where it's it's closely located to Mount Hermon, which is where the fallen angels um, originally had touched down. And that's where there's a UN outpost right now, a military outpost on top of Mount Hermon. And that is, you know, we're looking at territory that's being fought over right now. And possibly in September twenty third, if we're talking about Mars being over the Giza Pyramid. <clears throat> Maybe a time of war. It may tie into Mount Hermon. Portal. These are four portals, and well, these are two, but they had on the other picture. And this is dualism here. This being the two heads. So this is what they want to do: is they want to raise the dualism, the yin and the yang, and put the two together. Can we stop there for a second? Yeah. Um, the portal you're representing there as a. Um, as a rectangle, or they're representing it as a rectangle. And the reason that that is significant, there's two things. Number one, the adiabatic quantum computer, the quantum computer that we've talked so much about that they have built, is housed in a black cube. Um, that extends out into the model of the universe. The model that they're using in what I want to call their public relations campaign. When we talk about the Higgs boson, we talk about quantum particles and smashing particles or, or protons together and creating smaller particles. All of that discussion of quantum physics, everything that we have learned in school in terms of physics is based upon Einstein's gravitational model of the universe. Now, that gravitational model it utilizes right angles in geometry, 
right angles and rectangles and cubes. And rather than a electric model of the universe, which then represents the universe as curved space in the form of a sphere. Now, yeah, my, I'm glad that you brought that up. Okay, go ahead. So, I, as you guys know, and I can't divulge his name or the project they're involved in, but you guys know who I'm talking about already. Um, I post, I, I gave him my theory of the model of the universe being a sphere rather than a flat plane or a cube, which is the cube represents the gravitational model which is what we've all learned in school. Big Bang, all of that. And I presented it to him because he is a um, proponent of the electric model of the universe, meaning curved space. I said, does the sphere represent the universe? And he said, it absolutely does. And he went down and listed several things to um, prove that, so to speak, as best as we can prove it. So the electric model is different than the gravitational model geometrically in that the electric is a sphere or curved space. Here they're representing a portal rather than round. They're representing it as the gravitational model, which is right angles, the cube, or the rectangle. And yet in popular culture, as we know, Tim especially here, we've got typically they re represent a portal as a round gate. So what I'm getting at here is, and this is going to come up in my new book, Coalescence, there is a merging coalescence. There's a merging coming of the two theories, gravitational cube or rectangle to sphere, electrical model. The two are complementary. The two will merge. And in my book, I'm kind of giving away the punchline. The sphere and the cube merge. So I'm not going to say too much because I want Chris to have the floor here today. But I wanted to point out why they're representing the portal here as a rectangle because that's the gravitational model. And yet we're seeing through here representations of the electric model because of the use of electric plasma in returning and reconnecting things back to the golden age. So it's all pulling together. It's not exclusive. So you're representing the bending, the modification of the time-space continuum from yeah. what has been forced upon them, which is the square, the cube, to what they want, which existed in the Golden Age, which was the sphere, which is the portal, allowing them to return to the Golden Age. So you're seeing the manipulation through all of this power they're generating, 14 tera electron volts, it's not the collisions that's important. It's the power that's generated, which then creates a toroidal field, a magnetic field in the shape of a donut called a torus. And the center of that torus being around, being a spherical center, okay, that is the shape of the portal that will result, not a square, not a, not a rectangle, not a cube, but as you've correctly pointed out here, Chris, it is definitely a donut. It is definitely a sphere in the center of the donut and a sphere as the greater tor toroidal field of magnetic lines of force. That's what they're creating in the center of CERN. It's not particles that are generated. It's power that's generated to create this donut in the center of that point of collision where the streams cross. So it, they're generating magnetic fields. I want people to grasp this. This is a shift from the gravitational model to the electric model of the universe. No one, I'm telling you right now, there is no one who is revealing this. I'm not trying to say we're wonderful and you know, prophetic or anything else. It's just that the three of us have put our heads together for months now. And Chris is pulling this all together. She's taking all the pieces that the three of us have brought to the table. Well, I couldn't have done it. She chose to destroy the Tower of Babel, which we've related to being uh, the ancient version of the present Large Hadron Collider. 
I think that everything became imprisoned. I think all of these entities, sure, we have people, you know, that commune with, with demonic spirits and whatnot. But I think a prison was created. And I think a prison in the in the form of a cube was created. And they want to break out of that cube and they want to move back into this spherical realm that existed back in their golden age. And God is going to allow this. Um, uh, the, the physicist I was mentioning before that I have been consulting with, he is also a Christian believer. And the statement that he gave to me yesterday was pretty profound in the sense that I asked him the direct question, do you think that they're going to be successful with the Large Hadron Collider in terms of opening the portal? And he said, I can't answer the question about a portal because I don't know enough about it at this point. He said, I understand where you're going with this, and I understand the, the occult um, direction of wanting to open a portal. But from a physics standpoint, he said, I can't say whether they're going to be successful or not. However, from a spiritual standpoint, from my understanding of Scripture and through prayer, God will allow all evil to have its day. Anything that man can imagine, God will allow them to manifest. And the purpose for allowing, the, in this case, the Large Hadron Collider to be successful, and in our thinking here, it's successful in opening the portal, but the reason for their success to be allowed by God is so that all evil can be manifest have its day, and then to be done with it, to bring an end to all evil once and for all, without Satan being able to say to God, you didn't allow me to do as you said I could do, which was to be able to have my day and manifest all that I could dream and conjure and produce. And so it, I'm going to take from from this gentleman because it echoes the things that I have read and I believe they will be successful. What's, will it be this year? We don't know. But they will have their success in all of these occult practices and what the goals are that they are trying to achieve. It sounds depressing. However, it's giving us the opportunity to make a choice and that's the choice between God and, and Satan. And I won't go much further than that, but I just wanted to throw that out, Tim. I think yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay, so, so he's uh, an alchemist. You said that yeah. Thoth is an, is an alchemist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is, that's exactly the process at the Large Hadron Collider where they are actually, as you know, there's publicized articles that they actually change lead into gold. And their whole, their whole process is guided by the Tablet of Hermes. And part of what is contained in the Tablet of Hermes, which is green emerald, okay, mm -hmm. is the process of changing or the mutation of elements into other elements, not just lead into gold. That's the popular one. But literally at a quantum level, they now have the ability, not just through these collisions, but through the acceleration as well of particles, they're able to change the mass energy of solid particles and actually move and change the number of electrons in an atom and therefore be able to change lead into gold by changing the number of electrons that are circulating around the, nu the nucleus. So when you talk about Thaw being an alchemist, obviously there's that direct connection to the Large Hadron Collider at CERN and what they're doing and the connection to their spiritual practices, which is the motivation behind the building of the machine in the first place. Mm -hmm. they Talk about the electrical connection between the planets, between the stars, between the sun and the earth. And if you take that and lay that representation that you're seeing here into that model, those lines all represent electrical connections between all of these heavenly bodies. And when we talk about plasma, plasma represents the greater open field in this 
the, the spaces. In the gravitational model, they talk about the empty space, the vacuum, being comprised of dark energy and dark matter. In the electric model, they talk about those spaces as filled with plasma, electrically charged plasma, which is a fourth state of matter. Okay, and just like time is a is the fourth dimension, plasma is the fourth state of matter, and therefore these open spaces in this diagram are filled with plasma, and each of these planets in the moon and the earth and the sun are all connected electrically by electrical currents. And so they're representing to you energy, and oftentimes this is related to the human body uh, in the sense of the energy connections within the body itself and the different points within the body. But you can relate that out to the universe as represented here in much the same fashion because we live in a plasma environment and we all of the components of our bodies and all of the components of the heavenly bodies are all electrically interconnected and so you have when you're connected that way cute lines of communication you exchange energy and you can exchange information through those pathways so mm -hmm. I wanted to lay that over onto this because it's totally relevant to what we're talking about from a physics standpoint okay uh yeah, uh, for Chris's benefit, I just wanted to point out that uh, three, two, six triangle right there. That's the shape of the thing that's in Tony Stark's circular donut. <laughs> oh yeah, in his, in his chest because his, you've got you've got dot there as representing the heart. Well, that's mm -hmm. in the center of Tony Stark's chest. So yeah, yeah. exactly, Tim. Yeah, so that, that just that's your pop culture crossover with uh, that picture of Iron Man with the triangle in the circle. That's that and, right there, dot, and that. And your flux capacitor. Glad you mentioned the, the the folks that are bringing information our way. I want to do a blanket shout out to all of the people that are emailing, not just me, but all three of us. The, the audience is growing, and the audience is participating, and. I've, the question I've gotten many times is how can we get questions to any of us and so I would encourage you you know to go ahead and go to our websites and send in your email questions to any of us and we talk all the time on a daily basis with the three of us and we can send messages between each other and forward them on your behalf but there have been a lot of videos and a lot of articles that have been sent to me personally by people who um, join us here on this discussion and I'm really really grateful to the information that mm -hmm. we get because it leads us into really critical pathways and much of what we present here comes from our audience so mm -hmm. I wanted to acknowledge that but you're able to, Did to you read have these anything? pictures you're able to read these pictures like a book I one of the Christine I'll, I'll acknowledge I think Christine's probably watching she sent me an email and said you know you guys can read these pictures like a book it's amazing and it really this is what the Lord gives to us we're not special again we're just the conduits of information that take away any personal thing out of this whole discussion here we're just the conduits of information coming out but Chris could sit here she could do three hours just on this one picture of taking this apart and dissecting it and talking about what it means from the ancient stories and I could sit here along with Tim and we could do another three hours after she's done talking about popular culture and physics that's mm -hmm. all represented right in here so maybe at some point we'll just take one focus show and we'll just talk about and take apart all of these pieces and very quickly just talk about what they represent in physics, pop culture. Now that we have Chris's presenting it from a historical, from an ancient context, we could bring this up to the present time, but that would be for a different show. Oh, yeah. There, there's, I just want people to understand that when we're reading this, we're reading a lot of depth into this mm -hmm. because of the research we've done. And we'll try to share that as we go along. When you, when you look at... Um, shows on TV Tim like um, those survival shows and they talk they show about how to uh, rub 
sticks together to start start a fire. Right. Or you place the point of the stick into a stone or into a block of wood, and you create friction and you create fire. Right. The uh, the Indians, the natives, would use you know two pieces of well a, a loop of a thread or a vine around the pole, and they would move that pull back and forth by pulling on that string or on that vine very quickly, creating the fi friction down near the feet of these ah, two figures. Yes. And so you're creating fire here through friction. Right. Well, you're, do you're doing the same thing when you're accelerating particles in a circle. Right. You generate, so, as you know, through mm -hmm. friction, you generate heat, generating energy. Same thing with a particle collider. It's spinning just like this rod is spinning and it's creating energy in the form of terra electron volts and that's igniting energy generating energy through the collision of particles which is a result of spinning them like you're spinning this rod and if you will at the very top of that rod we're looking at the one with the two black figures the top of that rod you have the edge on view of a circle okay imagine looking down on that you'd see a circle we're looking at the edge of that circle, and that circle is being spun by these two figures. Again, wow. the, the partition at the Hilton, I opened it with the, um, the image of Homer as a scientist, as a physicist, working out the mathematical model for the um, mass energy equivalency of the Higgs boson, and that predated by nine months the actual, not nine months, several years, I should say, predated the supposed proof of the existence of the Higgs boson and its mass energy equivalency was only about 700 um, electron volts off of wow. what Homer had presented in The Simpsons. So I like to laugh about Homer and the donuts, but mm -hmm. here we go. I mean, they put it right out in front of us. Well, I think if um, we have anybody that is you know, going in the direction of um, the electric model of the universe, plasma, if they will focus on the toroidal fields, the uh, magnetic lines of force that are generated by particles under acceleration that then form this shape of magnetic lines of force, which is the torus, the donut. Um, this is the key. This is where I'm researching. This is what I'm bringing to a focal point in the book, Coalescence, that will be out in a few weeks. I'm giving it away, but I, I really want people to understand that what is going on below the surface, below the public relations with the heart, Large Hadron Collider, is not quantum physics. It's the magnetic universe, and it's all about the donut. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. You have any final words, Chris? Well, um, yeah, I do. I, I um, you know, I wanted to say hi to one of my friends that's listening and tell I agree with both of you. Um, it is interesting if we look at Bible prophecy in terms of Psalm 83, specifically the compassing, the surrounding of Israel. And I always picture Israel as in, in prophecy as being surrounded by an inner circle of enemies and then an outer circle of enemies. And what we're seeing right now is the buildup of the inner circle of enemies. And Netanyahu is feeling backed into a corner, especially because of the actions of our president. And therefore he sees this as a no-win situation in so far as taking a preemptive, and I think, Chris, that's what you were looking for, a preemptive strike against Iran, uh, be it the Bashir nuclear facility, be it other areas within Iran, certainly their nuclear capability is an existential threat to the existence of Israel. I, I do expect that Israel will take definitive military action this year it may fall on one of the blood moons, most definitely. Um, it will line up in there. It is interesting. Um, Israel sits right across, I think it's 70 kilometers from the island of Cyprus. 
Mm. <laughs> you like to be short about it. Um, I was looking at the map of the Middle East, and I was picturing myself as a general or an admiral, thinking militarily, strategically, where would I want to set up my headquarters if I were the enemy of Israel? And of course, Cyprus leapt right off the page at me. The thing that I found interesting, this goes back almost two years ago, was no one was discussing anything about Cyprus other than some of its economic issues that it had that were akin to the issues that um, the EU and Greece in particular were experiencing. What we're seeing today is Russia coming into Cyprus as an economic savior for Cyprus. This has already been done through back channels with George Soros in Greece. This is also George Soros and Putin coming in to Cyprus economically and militarily. The Russians already have a military presence in southern uh, Cyprus. What they're pre presenting, and this started earlier in February, early part of February, is building up their military forces, their naval forces specifically, in Cyprus. Um, that will provide an economic boost to the island, but it also provides a leaping off point for the capture and control of the oil and natural gas fields that many people have heard about beneath the ocean's floor between Cyprus and Israel. Right off the coast of Israel, the largest natural gas and oil deposits in the world, bar none, mostly because they're untapped. And because they're untapped, they are virgin oil. Now, where does that come up in the Bible? Virgin oil. I think it's it's um, important that people pay attention to Israel because it is the eye of God. It is the timepiece for biblical events to be unfolding. And so again, going back to uh, Purim, it is important that we pay attention to what Netanyahu says when he addresses Congress this year and also what he signals he may be sending in his speech. You know, it's just like when we listen to any of the leaders of the world, um, our president or Netanyahu, they don't always come right out and say what they're going to do, and especially if you're talking about a military strike. But there are little things that you can pick up between the, the lines, and I think our discernment that we are privileged to have helps us when we listen to someone like Netanyahu, who I believe is a Christian, he holds Bible studies in his home on a weekly basis. I believe that he is a uh, follower of Jesus, and therefore I think he will send messages to those who have the ears to hear. That is absolutely where we're going. You know, in Scripture, it refers to the mark of the beast in that you, no man will be able to buy or sell. Well, lots of people are familiar with that. What's the mechanism for that system? It is the Internet, too. ESnet 5 within the world of physics. Within our world, it is the Internet, too. Um, you will not have access to that unless you have the mark of the beast. And there are various mechanisms for providing that mark of the beast to you, either voluntarily or involuntarily. We could go into that as well. But essentially, yes, that is um, on our doorstep. It is factual. It is in place. Uh, to give you some of the hardware side of that, it's a fiber optic system. Already exists. Already interconnects 160 different laboratories around the world. That's the backbone. From there, it'll distribute out. And in my book, uh, Diamonds in the Rough, I present the scenario of eight computers, supercomputers, adiabatic quantum computers, seven of which are placed at each of the uh, seven churches in the book of Revelation that John wrote from the island of Patmos that are arranged essentially in a postal route in Turkey. Uh, the eighth computer is located on Cyprus, but that was a bait and switch. I'm kind of giving away the book a little bit, <laughs> but the actual artificially intelligent or sentient computer, the 2048 model, where 
part of the title where books derive from. Uh, the 2048 model actually is in Pergamon. Pergamon is one of the seven churches in Turkey. Interestingly, that was the throne of, of Satan, Pergamon, the city of Pergamon, the ancient city. Um, before World War II, that throne of Satan was removed block by block, stone blocks, and moved to Berlin and reconstructed. And a few years ago, our president stood before the world on the very steps of the throne of Satan and addressed the world. He then reproduced that at the Democratic National Convention, that same Satan of throne, uh, throne of Satan. So there are multiple things that are going on there that go back to what Chris is speaking of, and that is the spiritual aspects. I totally agree. What we are trying to do is open up your point of view, open up your perspective on the world, and realize that everything that happens in this world is driven from a spiritual standpoint. The New Agers want to call it spiritual energy. Fine. We are physical hosts of a spiritual being. We have the Holy Spirit within us. If we do not have the Holy Spirit within us, then there is something else within a person. And that's as clear as it gets, black and white. And that's why we are presenting the physics, we're presenting the politics, we're presenting the economics, the military issues that are going on, so that people understand that you do need to make a choice. We're just giving you all of the hints, we're giving you all of the facts, we're showing you the mainstream media events that are covered, and the hidden events that are covered, so that you understand that when we say this is a spiritual battle, you'll take our word for it, you'll investigate it, you'll seek the Lord on your own terms. We're just giving you all of the dominoes that are in place to say, hey, this is real. This is factual. You need to turn to Christ because there are only two directions to go, heaven or earth. Simple as that. Yeah. Well, in Scripture, they speak of the, uh, the, the, the new Savior, if you will, the Antichrist, that he will perform miracles and wonders and that he, the image of the beast, will be given life. Now, lots of people are familiar with the scripture, but I'm paraphrasing heavily here because I'm moving to the point of artificial intelligence and holographic images, and we spoke a little bit about that in our last discussion. Um, in a nutshell, I like to always get to the point. I believe that the image of the beast will be a holographic person that will be solid, that will be completely realistic should you touch this person, and will be able to perform what we would consider to be miracles. And that will be born out from the existing artificially intelligent computers that already exist that will be brought out into the public view. But it won't be called necessarily artificial intelligence. It, that aspect of it in terms of what is running this holographic image, this person, will be kept hidden. You won't know that this is a computer-generated, computer-controlled person. It'll simply be a holographic person that will perform all of these miracles. And again, that's just my connecting the dots from a physics standpoint of what technology exists and what I believe is hidden from us and exists as well. From the physics standpoint, the actual connection is made electromagnetically. What you have are satellites. We touched on this in the last in the last video, but I'll just reiterate. We have satellites in space, we have cell phone um, sites, we have mobile devices 
and hand handheld devices that will project and I'm being very simplistic but project energy to affect people at the DNA level because within their bodies they already have antenna now if you're talking about an RFID chip many people have seen the pictures of what appears to be a grain of rice size chip or instrument that has a coiled wire, a cop copper coil of wire within its transparent body. That's a very large example. I'm going to go to the nano level in a moment, but that's a large example of the mark of the beast, an RFID chip that is purely an antenna, and an antenna receives signals. So this isn't make-believe. This is in place. The system is there. It is there to control people by using microwave energy and other levels of energy within the electromagnetic spectrum, even to the point of affecting your brain waves, either in an alpha state, a beta state, or going to the pineal gland and affecting the pineal gland. Um, you're talking about frequencies and altering the frequencies of someone's brain waves and altering the frequencies of their DNA and how their DNA um, performs and how it replicates and to what form will that DNA replicate to, what will it change to. There are multiple facets in this. I mean this can be very difficult to encapsulate but briefly you have the ability to change people's DNA through vaccines you have the ability to do it environmentally through the aerosolized spraying in the atmosphere, what people call chemtrails. And people may have heard of things um, referred to as Morgellons disease, which is these little parasites that look like hairs, that look like fibers that are growing from people's bodies. And I can go into that in more detail if you like, but keeping it brief, you're talking about in Morgellons disease, you're talking about changing the DNA through parasites that live on the skin in the hair follicles or replace the hair follicles and cause the DNA within the body to change because you have received from the atmosphere through chemical spraying, if you will, um, nano particulates, nano robots. These are actually nano sized objects and, a, and a, a nanometer is one millionth of a meter. I mean it's just it's so small it takes a microwave to see it. This is what synchrotrons, particle accelerators are used for. We talked about this a couple of times. Part of what they do in the synchrotrons is generate large um, levels, high energy levels of microwaves in order to see into our DNA to see the, the protein to go to the nano level, one millionth of a millimeter, and see what is going on in the body. And when you can see it, you can manipulate it. Mm -hmm. So that's a big chunk to digest. I'm going to stop right there, but we can dig into other levels of that if you like. There you go. Is this sickening or what? I mean, you know, picture this scenario that if we want people to take the mark of the beast in the videos that you two have seen of mine where I was talking about pandemics and people demanding the virus, de demanding the vaccine because of whatever man-made construct virus is out there. Let's look at TPP in the same process because they will not use one mechanism for the deployment of the mark of the beast. There will be multiple ways that the mark of the beast is distributed to the populations. Picture this you have the shelves are empty, people are hungry, the only way you can get the food is if you take the mark of the beast to buy or sell. Who knows? Maybe this is a hint of it, maybe this is the start of it. You're talking about the compression of time and events. Um, in scripture, you know, the Lord speaks of um, the birth banks coming closer and closer together and growing in intensity. So I don't necessarily think that the, the, the country is going to be 
um, barren of food supplies because of what's going on on the with the the strikes. But I think this is just again much like in the movies, like Lucy and Transcendence. It's pre-programming. It's getting people um, worked up, getting them sensitive to hey, we can take the rug right out from under you. We can cut off all of your goods if we choose to. So you need to go along with the TPP. You need to be thankful that we're rolling the trucks again. We're offloading the ships. And you can breathe a sigh of relief because once again the government has come to your rescue. We have forced the unions to break their deadlock, those bad unions, you know, whatever you want to say about unions, it's irrelevant. But again, it's the entire process of creating the problem, creating the crisis, presenting the solution, and then implementing the solution, all with the goal in mind of the government being in total control of your life. And they do that through crisis management. Never let a good crisis go to waste. I don't, I don't put any dates on CERN's activities that are hard and fast. They publish what they want to publish for our consumption. I know that there have been a lot of power uh, step-ups. Part of the, the mechanics of CERN, just very briefly, the magnets have to be stair-stepped up in their power. Um, they'll power them up and then shut them down and then power them up to a another level. It's much like a NICAD battery that develops some memory. You have to deplete it all the way down or it develops some memory, which shorten or reduces its capacity. So they have to do this with the niobium titanium magnets to step them up. So they are doing that and they're doing low level collisions and diverting the beams into a beam dump. All that said, yes, CERN, if people will step back for a moment, and they, I've had many people email me and say, why are you so obsessed with CERN? Why do you keep talking about this on internet blog talk and in your books and the videos that I produce? And it's simple. It's a way for people to look at something that is physical, that is in this reality and say, why would all of the governments of the world and the top scientists of the world put all of this time and effort and money, billions and billions of dollars, into a machine if it was purely for research purposes? <clears throat> and that's where I want people to stop and take CERN seriously. You can say what you want about whether it's going to open a portal or if it's going to connect us to Saturn or whatever. Sure, you can sidestep those if you want much to your peril, I think you would, but sidestep it and just look at the fact that they built this machine and they're building it to twice the power level they had before and with the ability to generate a hundred times the magnetic force of our own magnetosphere that protects us as a shield from incoming gamma rays and whatnot from outer space, from the sun in particular. You gotta ask that question. Why are they doing it? Because it's not just for research. This is for the whole ball game. Um, there are a lot of distractions going on in the world. And when people talk about CERN or hear about it, their eyes glaze over because one, it's physics, and number two, they immediately hear, oh, portal. Okay, well that's wacko. Let's talk about CERN and its cousins, the synchrotrons and the particle accelerators around the world. Why do they have literally hundreds of particle accelerators, both straight line, linear, and circular or ring type, much like the CERN itself? Why do they have all of these particle accelerators that are smashing particles together. They're causing collisions and energies to be derived in the discovery of new particles. It is to get not just to the God particle, and I'm so sick of hearing about the Higgs boson I could scream. That's a little personal anecdote. But <laughs> they are trying to determine the structure of our DNA. 
so that at a nanoscale they can manipulate and create life. Two years ago, chemically, life was created from artificial DNA in the laboratory and this was out in the mainstream media. They are using the machines to build their own life forms. Now they can take on various shapes and, and structures and have different types of um, uses or applications. We touched on this in our last one. We talked about chimera, we talked about hybrids, we talked about transhumanism. But they want to play God, literally. They want to be able to say, at the nano level, if I take these two parts and put them together and add another part here and another part here, much like a chemist would do, I can create DNA and I can then grow the DNA into a life form of my own choosing and of my own design. I love to use the word hubris. If people don't know what that means, look it up in the dictionary. Because that is Satan. That's the nameplate I hang on Lucifer, is hubris. Because they believe that they can do the same thing that God has done in creating us and other forms of life. That's okay. the purpose of CERN, besides the portal. Multiple, multiple uses for CERN. One is the portal, but the other is the creation of life. Okay. I have talked about different categories, whether we're talking about direct cloning or we're talking about the mixing of DNA between animal and human DNA to form chimera or we're looking at the transhumanism level where you're mixing man and machine, artificially intelligent machine mixed with human DNA, those are all stair steps. Those are intermediate levels of advancement of research, of testing, to get to the point where, as I said a few moments ago, you can start with the raw materials. And when I say raw materials, I'm talking about Things like quarks, muons, electrons, protons, moving out to the molecular, to our um, periodic table of elements, and literally building from scratch the proteins that are necessary to create the actual DNA, and then the helix, be it a double or a triple helix of DNA, from which you can then begin to replicate the DNA, thus achieve the growth of a new being, a new creature. So the RH factor, really, you know, I can't answer that question as to why there's an RH positive and an RH negative. Um, there's a possibility that it has something to do with early mixing of DNA that occurred prior to the time of Noah's flood and this whole mixing of um, the DNA that took place with Nephilim, etc. That's a good question. I will have to dig into that. I know enough about DNA to tell you what's going on in terms of advanced research, but the origin of that RH factor, I'll just look it up, find out. Let's talk about AIDS for a moment because the or did I lose you? No, I'm here. Okay. AIDS is thought to have been derived from um, from monkeys, from the rhesus monkey. Um, there is a possibility, much like uh, a virus will cross what's known as the human blood barrier, where you, let's talk about avian flu. Many times in the media they talk about how the avian flu crossing the human blood-borne barrier. Until it actually crosses that barrier, humans are not at risk for acquiring the avian flu. The same process took place with AIDS during the early 1980s. It manifests itself as pneumonia, a new type of pneumonia. And I, as a paramedic for 27 years, I went through that period where we saw this new manifestation of AIDS in the population. 
and came to realize what it was. So talking about RH negative, RH positive, I believe that it's a form of a infection that took place, but I have to, again, say I have to research that more to say it definitively, but my suspicion is it is a crossing of that blood barrier, the human blood barrier by a virus that infected us and changed our DNA because virus, much different than a bacteria, a virus changes our protein. A virus performs and behaves much like a protein. They're almost indistinguishable unless you know what you're looking at. And therefore, I think that may be why they're so focused upon looking for people who have a certain type of blood, whether it's A positive, negative, O positive, O, whatever. But there are certain types of blood that lend themselves to this process of creating a new being through the artificial manipulation of DNA. You need to start with the pure DNA is really what we're talking about. Well, that it's gone dormant, that it's in hibernation. But because it is a man-made construct, it's a manipulated um, virus. Again, let's talk about the use of the particle accelerators and microwaves and being able to look at DNA and be able to look at the proteins. You can create proteins to be a targeted virus. And that's what Ebola is. The outbreak that we saw was a test run. It was to see how the population would react to it psychologically, but it was also a test run to see who was physically susceptible to that particular strain that they had put out into the population. It will come back. Not necessarily that it's dormant, but because it will be released again. Uh, I have no doubt that this was another one of the string of test runs that have been done by the government since, oh gosh, 1920s, 1930s. My own uh, San Francisco Bay Area in the 1950s was a victim of aerosolized spraying of biologicals to induce flu. And then the CDC and other agencies, health departments, were tracking the onset, the outbreak of the flu to see how it spread. So you're looking at the physical spreading of it through air currents, through person-to-person -person contact. You're also looking at who's susceptible and who is not susceptible, and then breaking that down into blood groups, blood types, and down into DNA. That's what Ebola is designed to do, is to determine who is susceptible, because Ebola is only, there are multiple forms and strains of Ebola, but there are other targeted viruses that have been created. We can call them patented, if you will, because the CDC holds the patents on Ebola, but other viruses as well. What you see is the targeting of different types of people based upon their DNA, as well as their blood types, with targeted viruses that will affect them in different ways, either to kill them or to modify them, to modify their behavior, to change them into different classes of types of people that will be used for different reasons. And as I said in some of my videos, people will lose the awareness that they've even been changed, and they will not recognize the changes in other people that have taken place either. And this is the insidious part of this. This is getting down to the end point of the, of the timetable, the, play, the playing out of this scenario. This will happen quickly. I believe it will happen this year. There will be widespread, and this is going to the book of Revelation again, the pale horse. This is going to the pandemics that will spread around the world that will either kill people or the ones that are not targeted for death because they will be targeted for death based on certain criteria that is related to their DNA. Those that they feel that are useful, they will not kill, but they will modify and change and purpose them to specific tasks that will serve the elite. Yeah. And the chemtrails and the aerosolized spraying, that is there are so many different applications to that, but it is, 
from a research standpoint, when looking at nanotechnology, that is clearly the predominant reason for the chemtrail spraying, is to infect the population with, this may sound a little strange, nanobots, nano-sized robots. Essentially, you're talking about, at a sub-microscopic level, organisms that are artificial, that behave like a bacteria, that behave like a virus, or behave like an animal. They are able to replicate themselves, reproduce themselves. They are programmed for specific tasks within the body, and some are for inducing cancers, for killing populations. Others are for changing how your thought process, changing your neurological pathways in your brain, going to the synapse and either activating or deactivating synapses. We've seen the manifestation of what people want to call, you know, zombie-like behavior in the population, whether they're shooters or they're people with knives. These are illustrations of how the brain is actually, at a nanoscale, affected. The pathways, the neuropathways are changed from within at the nano level by these nanobots. And therefore, you have people that can then be activated who can be changed from within, but activated and controlled and manipulated using electromagnetic energy, such as microwaves, directed energy um, systems. And this all sounds very far-fetched, but this is hard science. Everything that I speak of comes from science journals. I don't take things from other people that are not producing scientifically based information. I simply connect the dots from what is being produced by the laboratories and then put it in a spiritual context of what it is that we're looking at. I know you're pressed for time. I'll stop there. Well, I, I, you just made me think of Russ Dizdar's work.